So guys, this is a quite an important slide and it actually covers all the basic terms in networking. So if you are actually uh, starting uh, your journey towards um, cybersecurity, networking is one concept that really needs to be strong for you. So that's why what I've done here is I've just listed few items or I would say a few terms that you should know. We would be covering more deep dive uh, things and we would be covering more advanced topics, but this is more of very basic things. So if we really start with things like what is a host? So a host is nothing but any device on a network which sends or receives the traffic, right? So which sends or receives the traffic, who sends or who receives? So normally it would be a client and a server, right? So a client is actually sending the request and server is actually uh, sending the, uh, the, the output back, right? Normally, if you, let's say you go to hsbc.co.uk, you are sending a request to the web server and the web server is then sending or giving you the response in terms of the web page, right? So it is a host is nothing but a device which is sending or receiving the traffic. Then very important uh, concept is IP address. What is the IP address? Like you have house numbers, same way you can identify your hosts using a unique number, which we call a IP address, right? We'll, we'll see uh, more details on that uh, in, later in the video, but for the moment, you just uh, understand that an IP address is the identity of a host. How can you uniquely identify a host? You can do it through an IP address. Now, what is a network, right? Network. What transports the traffic between the hosts? So we learned about the hosts. So it is an entity which is transporting the traffic between the hosts. So all this communication which is taking place between the hosts, we say it's a network. So any two hosts connected form a network. So it means any two hosts, or it can be more than two hosts. But all we are trying to say is it's a connection or interconnection of several um, hosts becomes a network, right? Now, what is a subnet? So best way to understand uh, the subnet is to divide it sub network. Right. So we say subnet is a smaller network. So it is subnet, smaller network within a larger network. So let's say you have a big network address space in that you are creating several chunks. This is, let's say, subnet one. This is subnet two. Right. So subnet is a smaller network within a larger network created by dividing an IP address space into smaller subnets. Okay, very important concepts. People always get confused between a switch and a router. So switch is a device which facilitates the communication within the network. Very important terms and that's why I've highlighted within and between. So what does within means? Within means that let's say you are having a LAN, right? So whatever traffic that is taking place within that LAN, like it could be a school, um, a LAN of a school or a network of a school, a house network. So a switch is a device which helps in the communication within the network. You are staying within the network, right? But what is a router? Router, router is actually a device which facilitates or helps the communication between networks. So let's say this is network number one and this is network number two. So here we would place a router, right? Something like this. So this is my router. So that is what it says. So a router facilitates the communication between networks. Between networks means this is one network, this is other network, and they are talking to each other via a router. And switch is within. So you are within the constraints of within the boundaries of that network or the LAN in which you are. So yeah, uh, I, I think quite an important, um, uh, say, uh, slide for understanding the basic terms in networking. Thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. It's time to take a look at a very, very important concept in networking, which we call as OSI model. So OSI stands for the Open Systems Interconnection. It's a model or it's a conceptual framework that standardizes the functions of a communication system into seven different layers. So if you see, there are seven different layers which starts from bottom and goes up. 
So it's the physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. It, and this all is a theoretical concept, right? Uh, when networking uh, came into existence. And here what we've done is we've divided into different functions of each layer and the addressing mechanism that you use and the kind of devices that would be used in each layer, right? So the very first layer if we talk about is the physical layer. So the physical layer deals with the physical connection as a name suggests physical, something that is not logical, which exists, right? So it physically exists. So it deals with the physical connection and transmission of raw data bits over the network. Right. So raw data bits, if you see this, we, we talked about that computers always understand zeros and ones. Right. So this physical layer is responsible or it deals with the physical connection and transmission of raw bits. So if you see uh, the function is transporting the bits and the kind of devices here, we are talking about either cables that you'd be putting some Wi-Fi, uh, your hubs. Right. Then comes the data link layer and very important whenever um, network guys talk to you, they'll, they'll say, are you um, looking at this security at layer two or layer three? This is where the data link layer comes into picture. It is at layer two in networking. Right. So a data link layer is responsible for framing the data into packets. So if you see here, you are framing this, um, you are creating data frames into packets. Right. So it's responsible for framing the data into packets, error detection and basic flow control. That is what the data link layer uh, uh, takes care of. And if you see the function is hop to hop. So, so the network packet has go from one uh, hop to another hop, right? From one router to another router, right? And addressing wise in data link layer, we always talk about the MAC address. So as I told you, every network interface would have a unique MAC address. And the kind of de uh, devices we are talking about are switches, right? So this is hop to hop function and the addressing is MAC address and uh, the devices are switches, right? The next layer is the layer three uh, or the network layer, as the name suggests, network layer. So it focuses on routing, logical addressing, and forwarding data packets between different networks, right? So this was within, uh, as well as I always tell you, within the network and between the network. So we told you that whenever you're talking about network uh, packets going within the network, we use switches. And whenever you are talking about packets going uh, from your network to onto another network or between networks, we always talk about routers. So very important, the network layer, it focuses on routing because you are routing your packets, logical addressing, which is the IP addresses and forwarding the data packets between networks. So if, the, if you look at the function, it's actually the end-to-end -end transmission, end-to-end -end transmission of, of the network packet. Addressing, we use IP addresses. It could be IPv4 addresses, it could be IPv6 addresses. In terms of devices, we are talking about routers and uh, different hosts, right? So this is the network layer, or L, uh, you can say it is the layer three uh, uh, we are talking about. Then we talk about the uh, fourth layer, which is the transport layer. So the transport layer, it manages end-to-end -end communication. So end-to-end -end communication, uh, including error checking, flow control, and segment reassembly. So here, if you see, there's a segment reassembly taking place, and this is the transport layer that takes care of. So here, we are. the function is more service to service, and we are talking about more at the port level. So it could be UDP or TCP ports, right? Then comes more of session layer. So with session layer, we are saying it establishes, manages, and terminate sessions or connections between the applications. Then comes the number six, which is the presentation layer. As the name suggests, presentation. It, uh, you are presenting something, right? So it handles the data translation, encryption, compression, and ensures the data format compatibility. And then comes the topmost layer, which is the application layer, the topmost layer, application layer, which provides network services directly to the user applications, such as email, file transfer, remote access. So it is the application layer, which is which the user or the it's available to the end user, we say it. So it provides network services directly to the user applications, email, file transfer and remote access. So um, just remember, guys, that these layers work together to enable communication 
between devices across a network and the model serves as a reference point for network design, troubleshooting and understanding how different protocols interact with each other. So very important thing is this is a theoretical concept uh, about how devices, how networks or how packets within the network uh, would interact with each other. So it's basically a theoretical model which is called open systems interconnection. Very important. Thanks for watching. So it's time to do a uh, more deep dive into what a switch is. So guys, uh, you might remember I told you in the previous video where we actually learned this basic commands. I told you that a switch is a device which is used within a network, right? I told you that it is used within a network. Normally, like it, you, you would be using in a LAN. So let's say you have uh, your LAN or local area network within your office, within your school or at home. So this is a device which sits somewhere in your LAN, right? You, it is a device for uh, which helps to uh, transport information within the network, right? Okay. So it's a, it is a, a networking switch is a hardware device that connects devices together, right? It connects devices together. Now, if you see what these, this is what we call a port, right? So all these are different ports and these in turn will connect to certain devices, right? This will connect to one device. This would connect to another device. So what it is doing is this one switch is helping to connect all the devices within your network. So it connects devices together on a local area network or a LAN, right? It operates at the data link layer two. So uh, in, in just in the previous video, we studied about the OSI model and in OSI model, we also studied different uh, layers. So it operates at la layer two. So normally whenever you are talking to somebody in cybersecurity, they would normally talk about layer two network. Are you dealing at layer two network, layer three network? So this is what it, it means. So it operates at data link layer two of OSI model and is responsible for follow, forwarding the data packets between devices based on their MAC address. So every uh, device um, or every computer would, ha would have a network card and it would have some some MAC address here. So this would have its MAC address. This would have its MAC address. It goes like that. So every computer uh, would have its uh, network card. So network card and the network card would have a MAC address, right? So this helps to forward data packets between devices. So let's say this uh, device, this device, device D1 has to talk to device D2. Then there is another device D3 right it would also have its own network card and mac address so all the this communication takes place via the switch so it's not that they are connected directly they are connected through the switch right so when a data packet arrives at a switch the switch reads the destination mac address so normally a switch would maintain some kind of a table right so it would know which port is connected to which mac address right so when a data packet arrives uh, at a switch, the switch reads the destination MAC address and compares it to the table of MAC address associated with the ports on the switch. So let's say if I'm sending a request to for number D3, it, I, I will uh, send this request. This request goes to uh, the switch and switch will check its MAC address. So, sorry, uh, switch will ch uh, check its uh, table, uh, right? So if the switch knows which port the destination device is connected to, it forwards the uh, packet only to that port. So let's say when this arrives, if it if it knows that, okay, I need to go to, uh, uh, say for device number three, the port connected is number three itself, and the MAC address is something like this, then it can automatically forward it, right? So the switch knows which port the destination device is connected to, it forwards the packet only to that port, very important, right? So it's not uh, sending it to all the different ports. 
Why? Because it could get that information within its own uh, MAC address table, you can call it, right? So uh, this is what, but what if it doesn't know? So there, there are chances that it, it, uh, the, uh, the switch hasn't updated its, its table. So if the switch does not know the location of destination device, it broadcasts. So broadcast means it will give it to all the ports. It will send it to all the ports, right? It, the packets are sent to all ports except the one it was received on. So because the one that is actually sending the request, it, uh, it's it, that intelligent, it won't actually send the um, packet back to that um, device, but it will send to all the other devices on the network. So switches can have different number of ports. As I showed you, the, these, these are all different number of ports, which you can definitely go and connect devices and can support different data transfer rates. So normally we say 10 mega, uh, Mbps, 100,000 Mbps or even faster. Right. So switches can also support different network protocols. Now here we are talking about protocol. Protocol is nothing but a set of rules. So normally Ethernet is a pro protocol, fast Ethernet is a protocol, gigabit Ethernet is another protocol. So it can even support up to 10 G, normally we say 10 GE or 10 gigabit Ethernet as well. So these, so there are two things. One is switch can have different number of ports like these. And it can also support different number of protocols like Ethernet, fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet. And switches can be used, uh, that's the good thing about switches, right? Switches can be used not only in small businesses, but in larger networks as well. So if, if I ask you, what would be the purpose of a switch in a larger network, then you can think about VLANs and all. So from one switch, you can have multiple uh, networks created and you can have um, smaller networks, segments created. So switches can be used in smaller businesses on home network, as well as in large enterprise networks to segment the network. This is called a kind of a, we are creating smaller networks and into smaller parts and improve network performance. So guys, with this, we come to the end of the video for switches. I hope you got some good understanding about what a switch is. In the next video, we will take a look at a router. Thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. So in the previous video, we had a look at what is a switch. We did a good deep dive into what a switch is. Now we will do a good deep dive into what a router is. Another important uh, concept in the field of networking, what is a router? So we should have very good understanding of what a router is. And you might remember when we were doing our uh, terms, I told you a basic difference between a switch and a router. So the basic difference between a switch and a router was, we said that for a switch, you are always doing within. So the communication is taking place within a network. And for a router, the communication is taking place between networks, right? So what does it say? Between networks means that there is one network and there is another network. So you are talking to each other via the router, right? So that is all I want to say. And with switch, it is more localized communication, right? You're, you're not going out of the network, but you're staying still within the network, right? So let's take a look at um, some, some important uh, terminologies about a router. So router is a networking device. Right. It's sim similar to a switch. It's a networking device that connects multiple devices together and allows them to communicate with each other over a network. So as I said, you are communicating between networks through a router. Right. So uh, that's very important. It's a networking device. If you see, it looks very similar to a uh, to a switch, but it's actually uh, a router. And another thing to uh, note here is this is something which we call a routing table. So a router always keeps a routing table. So what does that routing table give you? So routing table will actually uh, give that. OK, in this case, one router is connected to uh, uh, these different interfaces on different networks or in real world, you could actually be connected to another router as well. So and this is how the actual communication takes place. And this could be connected to another router, right? So this is how it goes because you're not always connected to one router. Yeah, you could be connected to one uh, router and that router could be connected to another router and the communication or how a router talks to another router is uh, or how the traffic moves. We call it a hop. We always say that when the packets move, they hop from one router 
to the other router right and then uh, to the actual uh, device you can call it that way right and this routing table will actually give you that okay if i have to go to uh, this um, say uh, this network i uh, on which interface i'm connected if i'm going to this network which interface i'm connected so if you see if this guy has to talk to this guy then this has to go via the router through the routing table right so routers are commonly used in homes and businesses to connect devices like computers smartphones tablets uh, to the internet so this is i've taken an example of a geo uh, if you are based in india you would have seen your geo routers because you just think about it because you're connecting from your home or within your home network you are reaching internet so uh, you can just imagine that you are talking from or going from one network to another it means you need a router so that's why uh, you have routers right in place at home you would always check wherever you are running internet uh, or this is something uh, like a virgin media router in uk right and this is more i think more prevalent in india right so uh, routers are commonly used in homes and businesses to connect devices like computers a router acts as a gateway we say that it's a gateway between the devices on network and internet allowing them to send and receive network why it's a gateway because uh, you are going out if you if you think what, what is the concept of a gate like what is a gate if you if you break it down so gate is that you are opening the gate and you are entering somewhere else right so same way this is your network and you are entering you are going out of the network and entering another network so network two network one right so this is how it, it works so it's it acts as a gateway between the devices on the network and the internet routers typically have multiple ports yeah and they can be used to connect devices via ethernet cables wi-fi capability is also there so routers like like these ones they have got wi-fi capabilities right and this is a more um, you can say enterprise routers and they have, these have all the different ports right as we discussed right these have different ports so uh, routers have multiple ports can be used to connect devices via ethernet cables right uh, routers also have a range of security features now the good thing about routers is that you can actually enable a lot of things and we will, we will study about what are firewalls and all so that's why it's quite important to understand what uh, what a router is because at the end of the day it's it's actually a router which is working as a firewall so uh, so uh, it's important that it can uh, allow uh, or or actually uh, protect the network from unauthorized access you can have firewalls you can implement passwords password protection over there as well and a very important concept we call it virtual private network or a vpn so even uh, with your uh, the these devices you can uh, configure a vpn right virtual pr private ne network it could be kind of a tunnel right so between the client and the server you are putting a tunnel uh, that okay only the traffic for um, for distinct between the client and server will flow in that but some advanced uh, routers uh, f uh, give features like this so there's a quality of service to prioritize the network traffic or you could implement a uh, vpn for more um, secure connectivity um, and uh, yeah, the last point says in addition to home and business network routers are also used by ISPs. So even the ISPs, like I gave example of Geo, uh, Virgin Media, they uh, they or BT, they would also be having their own routers to connect the customers to internet because. Uh, and and we'll show uh, we'll show you in, in forthcoming uh, videos. So even for the internet service provider, when the packet goes to internet ser service provider, it has to be connected further. Right? Say you are reaching a server somewhere in US. So sitting sitting from UK, you send this request. This request or this packet will go to let's say uh, your your location or ISP, and then it has to travel uh, all the distance to the US. Right? So this all uh, goes through router to router. So that's why it says in addition to home and business networks, routers are also used by ISPs. So your internet service provider like Geo, Virgin Media, they would also be using their routers to connect the customers to the internet. So with this, we come to the end of the video. In the next video, we will take a look at another important concept in networking, VLANs or virtual LANs. Thanks for watching. So after having a look into what a switch is, what a router is, it's time to take a look into a concept called VLANs. Now, what exactly is a VLAN? So, so the best way to understand a VLAN is from a switch, right? So if you see this, this is a pretty big switch, right? So what we have done is we have segmented the switch into specific networks or we call uh, this is a VLAN 20 and this is a VLAN 30. 
right? So it will have its own set of computers which are talking to each other. It will have its own set of uh, hosts or computers that are talking to each other. And they don't connect to each other that way, right? So it is kind of isolated from each other. So this one is isolated or the traffic is isolated from this one. And this normally we do based on the ports that are there on the switch. So we dedicated cert certain ports for VLAN 20 and we dedicated certain ports for VLAN 30. Let's take a look what it is. So VLAN stands for virtual local area network. So very important virtual. So it's, you are having a physical switch and that physical switch has been divided into multiple LANs, right? Which is a logical grouping. So it's not a physical grouping. It is a logical grouping of network devices based on criteria such as department, function or security level. So how, what we can say is we can say that this VLAN is dedicated to, let's say, dev or this VLAN is dedicated to, say, prod. Right. So as I said, there's a complete isolation. Your traffic is isolated between dev and uh, uh, traffic is isolated between prod. Right. So it, you are getting, uh, say, various criteria. It could be based on a department. It could be based on the security level. VLANs allow network admins to segment a LAN into multiple VLANs. Just think about it. If there was one switch and we have just connected devices together, that would have formed one LAN. Right. This would have formed one LAN. But what? we are doing here is we are dividing that into multiple lands so we are calling it vlan1 and vlan2 so physically it's the same switch but logically we are segmenting it segment means dividing so you are dividing a lan into multiple virtual lands and with its own broadcast domain as i said Whatever traffic stays in VLAN 20 can't go to uh, VLAN 30 and whatever traffic is here, it stays here or whatever communication is taking place here. It's, it's all kind of isolated from each other. Right. VLANs are created by assigning ports on a switch to a particular VLAN. So exactly what I just told you that there are certain ports which are dedicated to this VLAN and there are certain ports which are dedicated to this VLAN. So you are creating by assigning the ports on a switch to a particular VLAN, which can be based on various factors such as MAC address, IP address protocol. right? So devices within the same VLAN can communicate with each other as if they are on the same physical LAN. So these devices, they, they are not even aware of that there is some, something like a virtual LAN. They would think that, oh, I'm part of a LAN. So I, I need to contact this guy. So probably there's a switch in between. So they can just, just uh, contact each other via this switch, right? So all it says is devices within the same VLAN can communicate with each other as if they are on same physical LAN, even if they are physically located in different parts of the network. Devices in a different VLANs cannot communicate directly with each other without the use of a router or a layer 3 switch. Now think about it that this is kind of a network 1 and this is a network 2, right? Now it, because it's formed a new network here and what did we learn? That whenever you have to uh, communicate or go from one network to another, you would actually need a router or a layer 3 switch in between, right? So that is what it says. So devices in different VLANs, let's say there are devices that are in VLAN 20, if they have to communicate directly to devices in VLAN 30, although normally we won't do that, let, let's say if you've isolated it, but if there are certain use cases where you want uh, this traffic or uh, certain computers to talk to certain computers on um, the other VLAN, then you would have to do it via switch or a router. It simplifies the network management by allowing different policies to different VLANs. So as I said, if it is dev, it is prod, you can easily apply different uh, network policies and it uh, really simplifies the network management for the uh, network administrators. And VLANs are widely used in enterprise network. Yes, pretty much so. Any enterprise you go to, you will always find a VLANs data centers and service providers, networks to improve network scalability, security and manageability. You can easily make out that you can get more scalability. Otherwise, if you think if you were using just one switch, you would have just created one LAN, right? But here you are creating multiple networks. You are segmenting that LAN into multiple networks. You are getting security. You are getting security because as I, as I told you, you can isolate the traffic from one VLAN to another. And manageability is there because it simplifies the network management. It allows different uh, policies to be placed on different VLANs. So with this, we come to the end of the um, video on uh, VLANs. Now we will start discussing about certain things around IP addresses and how do you uh, convert a binary to a decimal and a decimal to a binary. Very important lectures. I'll see you there. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. So from our, uh, I would say, 
say college days, we have been taught that computers always understand binary format, right? When you say binary format, it is basically in zeros and ones. So binary is always either a zero or a one. So that this is the kind of language that computer understands, right? But then uh, the, the question comes to mind, but how does this uh, conversion between a binary to a decimal number or a decimal number to a binary number takes place? Uh, and what is the kind of an algorithm, how it is done? I always used to think. So I thought it's better we actually come up with a video on that and give an explanation of that. So let's say you start with a binary number. So binary, as I said, is always in form of zeros and ones. So let's say the number is one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. So you always start from here to here, right? So you always start from the back. And what you need to do is you need to need to do two to the power. And if you see, this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. So you have one, two, three, four, five, right? So it is zero, one, two, three, four, five. This way you go. So you do two to the power zero times zero, right? So this is this zero and this zero, right? So two to the power zero is one. 1 times 0 is 0. So we get 0 as uh, the, the value. Then we move to here. 2 to the power 1. 2 times 1 is 2. And times 1, so this 1, this 1, right? So 2 times 1 is 2. Same way, 2 to the, two to the power 2. 2, 2 to the power 2 means 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 0 is 0. Which 0? This 0 and this 0. Right. So this way we start doing the calculation 2 to the power 3 times 1, 2 to the power 4 times 0, 2 to the power 5 times 1. And you'll see we'll get figures something like this 0, 2, 0, 8, this. So all you need to do is now you need to add all these. So basically you simply add all these to get the number 42. So which means that if computer, if you are sending 10101010 to computer, then the computer can actually uh, understand that this number is actually a number 42. So once again, you always go from this way to this way. So from right to left, right? And you start computing or compute, uh, computing it in a way 2 to the power 0 times the, num the value. 2 to the power 1 times the value 2 to the power 2 times the value and this way you keep going on and whatever result you get you get and add all these together to get the real number so uh, this was more binary to decimal conversion now in next video we will take a look at how you can convert a decimal to a binary right because you need to see how a decimal number if you again giving a number like 42 or 72 how does computer change it to a binary number thanks for watching Hi folks, welcome back. So in the previous video, we had a look at how you can convert a binary number to a decimal number, right? So you might remember that we took 10110 and we started from right to left, right? And we did more of like two to the power zero times uh, whatever the number was, then uh, the two to the power one, two to the power two and, and all that stuff, right? So now we need to see how you can convert a decimal number to a binary number. So what we need to do is you need to start with a number. Let's say we start with number 27 and you start dividing it by two, right? So we say two, to the, two, two times one is two, two times three is six, right? So the remainder is one, right? So now what you need to do is you need to write the quotient, this is 13 here and the remainder here right same way now you are left with 13 you start with 13 right you say 2 times 6 is 12 right so what is this 6 6 here and what is your remainder here right same way you keep on doing you do 2 times 3 is 6 remainder is 0 2 times 1 remainder is 1 2 times 0 remainder is 1 and now you have to write from here to top so in, in a way you can say 27 equates to 11011, right? Very important guys, it's very important to know how you can convert a decimal number to a binary number and how you can convert a binary number to a decimal number. Again, uh, it's very easy. You start with the number, start dividing it by two, right? 
So you get a question, you get a remainder, you keep uh, keep track of uh, the your answer, right? When you uh, divide uh, 27 by 2, you get uh, the answer as 13, but the remainder is 1. So keep track of this. So keep dividing each number by 2. Keep dividing it till the time you finish with the, with all the numbers and then you get the real number, which is 11011. So thanks for watching. So in the next video, we will take a look at, please don't go anywhere, I'll say, because we would be discussing a very, very important topic in networking, IP addressing. So what is an IP address, right? It is, I would say, guys, a backbone of the whole internet or the backbone of networking itself. So please don't miss that topic. What is an IP address? Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to another interesting video. This is all about IP addresses. Now I say that this video or this lesson is the backbone of the whole internet or the networks, right? It's very important to understand what is an IP address. So let's take a look and we'll actually uh, describe all the different uh, points that we have mentioned over here, right? Let's go one by one. So what does it say? It says an IP address is a unique identifier assigned to each network, each device on a network used to identify and communicate with other devices. So very important thing is unique identifier. It is a unique identifier. So we, we uh, read about that in a network you have hosts, like you have a client, you have a server or various clients and servers. Now, this IP address is a unique identifier. So this is the identifier from which you can identify a host. Like if you take an example of houses, like house, house would have a house number. Every house would have a house number in a street, right? Same way, every host in a network would have an IP address. And this IP address will help you to uniquely identify that host in that whole big network, right? Okay, so IP, as we say IP, it stands for Internet Protocol, right? Important, Internet Protocol. IP stands for Internet Protocol. What is protocol? Protocol is nothing but a set of rules. Now, that set of rules that govern how data is transmitted. So it is all about transmission of data. So as, as we are uh, learning networks, so it is all about transmission of data from one computer to another computer or from one host to another host. Now there are two versions of IP addresses. Remember guys, there is IPv4 and IPv6. So IPv4 is more popular and you would always be using IPv4 most of the time, but IPv6 is uh, actually, I would say a newer version of IP addressing and it is, it is not that common. And here we've uh, done a, a kind of a comparison if you see, IPv4 was deployed back in 1981 and uh, IPv6 came in 1998. It is not that old, but still it's, it's, it is not that popular as well. So IPv4 uses 32-bit addresses. So if you have to understand the 32-bit uh, addresses, how we say is it's always divided into octets. So this is the first octet, second octet, third octet, fourth octet, right? And every octet has got eight bits. Right. So this is one byte is equivalent to eight bits. So eight, 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 which makes 34, 32 bits. Right. For four times eight is 32. So same way, 32 bits. And that is what it says. It's a 32 bit IP address space. So it's first octet, second, third, fourth, and each octet has got bits. The first octet has got eight bits, eight bits, eight bits, eight bits. And these bits are binaries, right? It between uh, it's, it's either one or a zero, right? So this is how you get 32 bits. But IPv6 are quite large. So they are 128 bit uh, IP addresses, IPv6. So this is an example of a IPv6. It's, it's difficult to understand an IPv6 address because it's always in a hexadecimal. It is always in hexadecimal and it will come later on. Just remember that IPv6 are more newer kind of IP addresses. And if you see IPv4, if you check up with the address space, they are around 4.3 billion addresses, right? But IPv6 
IPv6 has a very, very large number. You, you can see uh, 7.9 times 10 to the power of 28 addresses. So it's, it's, it's a huge, huge number. So it can, um, why the, uh, the, uh, the mathematicians came up with IPv6 is because we are already running low on IPv4 addresses. That's why uh, they wanted to come up with a new notation of IP addresses and that's why they came up with IPv6, right? So IPv4 addresses are 32 bits long. We already studied that here. So it is 32 bits long and as expressed as four decimal numbers. So first decimal number, second, third, fourth, and these are all octets. Right? IPv6 are 128 bits long and expressed in hexadecimal format. So this, this is how a hexadecimal looks like. It is in uh, 128 bits format. IP addresses are divided into two parts, the network address and the host address. So always important when you're, uh, whenever you're looking at a uh, IP address, there is always a network part and there is always a host part. Now this it will always depend on the subnet mask. So if the subnet mask is 16 slash 16, it means so eight times two, which is 16. So it means first two um, octets are reserved for the network here, right? because it's 16. If it had been slash 24, then I would have reserved first three octets uh, for uh, the uh, network. So very important and we'll, we'll take a look when we uh, understand subnetting. But for the moment, what you need to understand is that this whole IP address is divided into two parts. parts. The one part is network part and other part is host part. Very important, right? So if it was slash 16, it means that we are talking about two octets are reserved for network. And if you see here, the first two octets are reserved for network and the rest two are reserved for the host part, right? This is slash 16. Perfect. Okay, so if I uh, say what, what it, the slide says, IP addresses are divided into two parts, the network address and host address. Network address identifies the network to which device belongs, host address uh, speci uh, gives the specific device on network. So what it means is that it could be 172.16.1. Uh, you could have 1.10, 1 1.20, 1 1.15, 1 1.16 or 2.16. Uh, so that way this is your these are all your host addresses. Like whatever hosts you are having on that network you would give, be giving IP address for that. So IP addresses are assigned either statically uh, by the administrator or dynamically. So what it means is statically. Statically means that you are configuring it um, by hand, right? And uh, or you can do it dynamically by DHCP. So DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So all it is doing is, let's say if you uh, if you are having or if, let's say if you restart uh, your uh, servers and you are giving DHCP, so DHCP will automatically uh, give the IP addresses based on the range it's configured with but if it is static static means fixed so you can say fixed this is fixed your IP address is fixed with static right um, public IP addresses are used to communicate with devices on the internet now it's very important let's say you uh, set up a device in cloud somewhere let's say you set up a server somewhere in the cloud right now, if you're sitting on the home network and you want to access that device, until and unless that device has a public address, you can't, right? Uh, uh, until unless you have a network or, or a connectivity between your home network to the uh, cloud network through a VPN, you won't be able to access. But if you're just simply, if you simply want to access that device sitting from internet, on the internet from your home network, then it needs to have a public IP address. So that's why the public, as the name suggests, public is, is publicly available, right? And private, private is something that is used within a private network, right? So let's say uh, you would normally give a private network to a database. Uh, you, you will keep a database on a private network. You will never keep a database in, in a public network, right? So IP addresses can be used to track a device's location, which has implications for privacy and security. Very important. So uh, if I if I today do uh, what is my uh, IP address, right? Right now I'm, I'm connected on internet. If you right now do what is my IP address, you'll see that you will actually get an IP address and it will tell you that, okay, you are a person who is located in UK, in London and this, this location, right? So it really helps us to track a device's location. As, as, as I told you, IP address 
gives a unique identifier for the host. So right now I'm connected to the internet. I have uh, some some unique identifier or some unique address given to me. So if I do what is my IP address, it will tell you the exact uh, IP address and even my location, where am I located? So th that's why it's quite important for privacy and security as well. So yeah, um, with this, I would say uh, you, uh, we come to the end of the IP address lecture, but we will now be discussing very, very important points about um, networking, which is subnetting and subnet mask. You would have always heard these terms, but we will do a more scrutiny, a deep dive into what is subnetting, what is uh, subnet mask. So please don't miss those lectures. Thanks for watching. So in the previous video, we saw what is IP address, right? And when we did IP address, I told you that an IP address is actually comprises of the network portion and the host portion, right? That is what we clearly understood, right? And now we will be talking about what is subnetting. Now, guys, uh, I like to say that this is something that a network administrator would be doing, right? A network administrator or a network architect would be the person who would be creating these subnets or deciding the subnet masks. But you as a cybersecurity professional needs to have good understanding of the basics. So that is what my aim is to teach you the basics of cybersecurity or to teach you the basics of networking. Because as I said, networking is a main component in cybersecurity. So let's take a look. Okay, so subnetting is a technique used in networking to divide a large network into smaller subnetworks. So the important word here is divide. And as the name suggests, subnetting sub, right? Sub means we are dividing it, a large network into smaller subnetworks. So always remember when we are saying subnetwork, it is a subset, as you said, normally say subset, right? So you're dividing a big thing into a small thing, right? Always remember. So subnetting, you're dividing a big network into smaller, smaller networks. And these smaller subnetworks are called subnets, 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 right? Okay. The purpose of subnetting is to improve the network efficiency and security by controlling the flow of traffic and segmenting different departments or functions of an organization. So as I said, um, so what we can do is you can create several subnets, like one subnet can be for UAT, one subnet can be for prod, one subnet can be for dev, right? This way also you can do it. So you, you have a big network and you are segmenting or dividing that big network into smaller, smaller networks. It helps to improve the network efficiency. And you can always do it based on different departments or functions as well, right? So each subnet has its own network address and can contain multiple devices that share that address, such as computers, servers, printers. So each subnet, as I said, will have its own network address, right? So, so let's start uh, and try and understand this. So here what it is saying is like, an IP address, as I said, comprises of the network portion and the host portion, right? So what we are doing is, and always remember, and we'll talk about it further as well, that let's say this is your network address and this is your host identifier. To create or to create more networks out of this, what you can do is you can divide it further. So this can be divided further to get another subnet. And here again, you are having the host the subnet identifier and the host identifier right so you are actually breaking this big network into smaller sub networks or more networks right again if you take an example here let's say you had a 256 address space and your network was 200.100.10.0 and it says the the mask is slash 24 so slash 24 means you are reserving three octets three octets for your network, right? So network portion would be three octets and the host portion would be one octet, which is this, right? So that's how you, what you do is now you divide it into two uh, subnets or subnetworks with 128 addresses each, right? So 128, 128 becomes 256. But this acts as a different network and this acts as a different network. And you give 200.100.10.0 
slash 25 and 200.100.10.0 uh, slash 25. So 128 addresses are in this space and 128 addresses are in this space. So all I'm trying to say here is that each subnet has its own address space. So now this subnet has got its own address space or own set of IPs. This subnet has its own set of uh, IPs, right? Or own address space. Very important. Subnet is done by borrowing the bits from the host portion. So as we can see, this was the host identifier in the IP address. So you're borrowing some bits. So it's, it's all the, um, it's all about the zeros and ones, right? So you are borrowing some, uh, some, some uh, bits out of your host portion. Now, when you borrow the uh, bits from host portion, you are actually dividing that and you are creating it as a subnet identifier and the host identifier, right? So here it was only a host identifier, but you create a subnet identifier and a host identifier. So subnet is uh, done by borrowing the bits from host portion of IP address and using them to create a new network. So this is what we did. We, we divided that, this and we have come up with a new network or we had this address space. We divided it into two networks and we have got two subnets, right? The subnet mask is a binary number that identifies the network and subnet portion. And we will, we will have a look at subnet mask in the next video. But uh, as you can see, this is my subnet mask. This is my subnet mask slash 24, right? The subnet mask is a binary number uh, that identifies the network and subnet portion. So as I said, if you're saying slash 24, it means eight times three is 24. So you're reserving three octets for your network portion. So only one octet is left for your host portion. And that is what it says. The subnet is a binary number that identifies the network and subnet portion of IP address, allowing the devices to, uh, to distinguish the two parts. Subnetting can be implemented using either classful or classless addressing scheme. But Fine. So um, it, it can be actually available for both. So you can implement uh, the uh, subnetting for either classful addresses or you can um, implement it for the classless addresses. Subnet requires careful planning. It's very important. As I said, it is something that your network administrators would be doing. So it requires uh, careful planning and design as well as good understanding of the network topology, addressing and routing protocols, right? So it's very important uh, that your network administrator uh, creates these subnets uh, based on careful planning. So why we are uh, studying it is because it's very important when you're talking to your network, network administrators, they will be talking to you as cybersecurity guys in terms of, okay, I'm using this subnet or this is my subnet mask. If you don't know the, your basics uh, of, of networks, IP addresses, subnet, subnet mask, then really becomes difficult for you to understand their terminologies, right? So in next video, it's very important that you understand what is a subnet mask. So thanks for watching. Okay, guys, um, you'll say that I keep mentioning it's very important, very important, but it actually is. So another key terminology is subnet mask. So in the previous video, we saw what is subnetting, where you were taking a big network and we are dividing into multiple networks. Now we will take a look at what is a subnet mask. Okay, so a subnet mask is a 32 bit value that is used to divide an IP address into a network address and a host address. So the concept is still the same. You are actually dividing an IP address into a network address and the host address, right? So it's, it's basically a value that you will give and which will help you to divide the IP into network address and host address. And we will take a look at how it is done. So the subnet mask consists of a series of ones followed by a series of zeros. So as I said, it is always zeros and ones, right? Where the ones indicate the network portion and the zeros indicate the host portion. So whatever you have ones in, uh, in this, uh, it will be your network portion. Whatever zeros you have is the host portion. So let's try and get an understanding on how this is done. So if, if I have a network, or if I have an IP, something like 192.168.123.132, just by giving the IP address, you will not come to know like how much of these bits are the network portion or how much are the 
host portion. So that's why they say that always you should know your subnet mask. So in this case, let's say the subnet mask, which is quite popular, is 255.255.255.0. Now this 255 uh, actually translates to all ones, right? So because we did that 2 to the power 0, 2 to the power 1, that way you can say that if I do 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, this will equate to 255. So because again, this is 255, this is 1, 1, 1, this is 0, this is 1, 1, 1, 1, and this is zeros, and then all the bits are 0. So <clears throat> what does it indicate that this is a 255.255.255.0 subnet mask and this also equates to we can say it is slash 24 what does it mean which means that three octets are reserved for the network portion and if you see these three octets we have reserved for the network portion and this one octet is reserved for the host portion and that's exactly what it is showing in the figure as well so if you see the first three octets are giving me the network portion and the last octet is giving me the uh, host portion and this whole thing is 32 bits right and this subnet mask is 255.255.255.0 and the subnet actually becomes 192.168.123.0 which again means that the first three octets are your network portion and the last octet is your host portion right so from here you can start creating your ip addresses like 123.1.2.3.4 uh, like that it, it will keep on going right so uh, applying the subnet mask to an ip address allows you to determine which subnet the address belongs to and which hosts on that subnet so as i said if i just simply give you one ip address you won't come to know that how many um, say computers or how many hosts are in that network but if i give you uh, 192.168.123. Uh, 132 slash 24 then you will come to know ah okay so the first three um, octets are reserved for the network portion and only the last octet is reserved for the host portion this way you'll come to know okay how many hosts can i have in my network so a common subnet mask for private network is 255.255.255.0 which we just studied which means that the first three octets are ip address and the last one is host address Subnetting allows for better network management and security by creating more manageable networks within a larger network. So you already studied, right? So uh, we said that uh, with subnetting, which we studied in the uh, previous lecture, subnetting is actually allowing you to bet, uh, to have better network management, security, manageable networks, because you are creating several uh, smaller networks out of it, right? So, okay, so it is important to choose an appropriate subnet mask to ensure that you have enough IP addresses for your device while also avoiding the wasting IP. So as I said that this is something that your network administrator would be doing. So it's very important that you choose the right subnet mask. So if I choose smaller numbers like one uh, slash 16, then automatically uh, the uh, number of computers that can be in that um, network would, would, would vary, right, would change. That's why it's very important that I choose the right number so that I don't waste uh, the IP addresses as well. Okay, so if I'm choosing slash 16, then uh, I'm, I will be having lot many more hosts because with slash 16, the first two octets would be reserved for network and rest two would be for hosts, which means that you can have large number of hosts in your network. But do you really want that large network? If you don't want, then you could go with something like a slash 24 or a smaller network as well. So all it is trying to say is with subnet mask, it is helping you to divide your IP address into the network address and the host address, right? So it's very important that you choose your subnet mask correctly. So I think with this, you've got good understanding about subnet mask. Another important um, topic comes after this, which is ARP. A very, very interesting demo is coming up on ARP. I'll show you a video on ARP. What is ARP? What is address resolution protocol? Again, if ARP was not there, I would say the two devices or different devices might not have been able to communicate with each other. So very important point up. Let's take a look in the next video. Thanks for watching. Hello, folks. So another interesting um, concept comes your way, and this is called 
ARP, ARP or ARP, right? So um, again, if ARP has, was not there in in the field of networking, then probably two computers wouldn't have been able to talk to each other, and that is the importance of ARP. Now let's try and understand what does ARP mean. Okay, so let's get our nice pen out. Okay, so okay. So ARP is a protocol. First of all, it is a protocol, right? ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. We'll, we'll uh, talk about in the second point as well. So ARP is an address resolution protocol. And what is a protocol? By now, uh, by now, I think all of you know, yes. A protocol is a set of rules. So ARP is a protocol which is used in computer networks to map a physical address to an IP address. Now, the thing is that we are talking here about a MAC address. So every host on a computer will always have a NIC card, right? And this NIC card or the network interface card will have something called a MAC address, which is kind of a unique physical address of that machine, right? Like as we uh, discussed about IP address, same way we have the MAC addresses, which is actually related to the, to the interface card or the physical address address uh, to an IP address, right? Now, if we try and understand uh, what app does, there is a concept of request and there is a concept of response, right? And we will see in next uh, video as well. There is always a app request made and there is always an app response made. So let's say this host wants to communicate with this host, which is 34.40.21.20. But now the thing is that you are connected to other hosts as well in the network through a router, through a switch, right? So what happens as a host, you will actually send a request and this is a request you will make. You are making an app request. You're requesting the MAC address of this IP address. So, so because you are connected on layer three, you have the IP address of the source machine, you have the IP of the destination machine, but you don't have the MAC address of the destination machine, right? So this is where you will send an ARP request. So ARP request goes on the network and whichever is the listening. So all these um, say, let's say um, devices are listening to this request. So as soon as that request comes, every device will say, okay, this comes and checks whether I am 34.40.21.20, you are not, whether I am, you are not. So this guy is, and then sends a response back. So this is called an ARP response. So this guy will send an ARP response back saying, hey, I am uh, the guy with this MAC address uh, and for this against this IP. And this request goes back to the host. And now the host knows, okay, I need to go to this particular host to reach uh, or, or take this packet over. Okay? So ARP is used by the data link layer of the OSI model to resolve the network layer address to the physical address, right? That is what we studied in OSI um, lecture that MAC addresses come at layer two level. So which is the data link layer. Now, uh, as I already told you, when a device needs to send data, to another device on the same network, it first looks up the destination IP address in its ARP cache. So here uh, you will always maintain some kind of a cache, which is ARP cache. Here you will have source IP address, source MAC address, destination IP address, destination MAC address, right? So if something is already there in the ARP cache, then you don't have to send a broadcast out. If it is already there, you just simply use it. If it is not there, then you send a request on your network, right? So let's take it one by one. So when a device needs to send the data to another device on the same network, it first looks into the ARP cache. So if the MAC address of that IP is not already in the ARP cache, like this example, let's say the MAC address of this machine was not in our ARP cache, right? Then it sends out a ARP broadcast. So here it is requesting or going on a broadcast, but it's going everywhere. It's going here, it's going here to all the hosts, right? Perfect. Okay. The device with the corresponding IP address responds with its MAC address. So as I said, this machine will say, no, I'm not this IP. This will say, no, I'm not uh, this IP. This says, yes, and the IP raises the hand and it 
will send a response back. So that is what it says. It responds, responds with its MAC address. So this will actually give back the MAC address. It will say I am actually connected on this MAC address. Don't worry if you're getting confused. We have another a very good uh, demo on that. It's, it's, it's a kind of a simulation of this whole app thing, how it works. And we will understand over there as well. So the device with the corresponding IP address responds with its MAC address and the requesting device updates its app cache. So here it will update its app cache. Now for any forthcoming uh, or, or uh, next requests, it can easily go into the app cache and get the data from there rather than actually sending it every time back to the network. So app mappings are typically cached for a short period of time to avoid excessive app traffic on the network. So uh, we, we normally cache it for a short period of time. We, we don't, uh, don't reserve it for too long. But then it also says that a um, lot of hackers they make use of something called app spoofing because they can misuse this protocol as well. So where the attacker can send fake app messages, just think that uh, the attacker is saying, okay, um, I need to reach to this IP, give me the uh, this and, and the attacker starts responding, hey, uh, I am I am the one with IP address this, come to, my, uh, come to me, I'm, I'm the one. So it is he's trying to attract you towards his MAC address, right? So that, that's where we need to be very careful that if it is not used properly, then app spoofing can happen as well. In the next video, I will show you a complete simulation of app. How does app work? How does one machine talk to another machine? Thanks for watching. Okay, so in the previous video, we had a look at what is an ARP or the address resolution, resolution protocol. In this lecture or in this video, we will take a look at the simulation of ARP. How uh, you can actually really simulate when one machine in the network needs to talk to another machine in the network. So let's take an example of this network, right? It's a simple network. You can think of it as, as a LAN because if you see, there are different switches connected here, right? So this PC or this host is connected to this switch, then this switch is connected to switch two. With switch two, you have um, another uh, system connected. There could be multiple systems here. Then when you have switch three, you have switch four. Now the requirement is if I, play this video, it says I need to ping 10.1.1.3, right? So where is 10.1.1.3? So 10.1.1.3 is sitting somewhere over here. Now, just imagine that a PC, which is 10.1.1 has to connect to 10.1.1.3. Now, how does it know? How, how does it go about it? Okay, one is IP address, that is fine. But for the packet or for the data to reach to the actual destination, it needs to know its physical address as well or the MAC address as well. And this is where the app cache comes into picture. So the app cache would look something like this. So if I play again, so it is an ICMP request because you're doing a ping, right? Let's fill these details and we stop here, right? Sorry, we stop here, right? So what it says is, I want to ping 10.1.1.3. Fine, you want to ping, it is an ICMP request. What is your source IP? So your source IP is 10.1.1, which is this one, this guy here. What is your destination IP? Yes, I know my destination IP 10.1.1.3, which is this one. Do you know your source Mac? Yes, I know because I'm sitting here. It is AAA. So it's just taken as an example, right? Normally Mac addresses are pretty long, but here we are just taking, let's say, first three, um, uh, first three uh, digits or first three uh, characters, I would say, for the Mac address, right? But we don't know the, uh, the destination Mac address. That is where the problem starts. And that is where the app comes into picture. Now, what would happen, as I told you in the previous video, an ARP request will have to be broadcast on the network. I am requesting, so the ARP request will say, hey, anybody there with this IP address, I need your MAC address. So let's see what happens, okay? So what is the MAC address of this? This ARP request goes, right? Okay, let's wait. So what happens? So the, uh, the ARP request goes or broadcast is broadcast over the network. So it is asking, what is the Mac of this? What is the Mac of this? What is the Mac of this? Now these guys, they know that I am not 10.1.1.3. Why should I respond to it? And this guy also knows why should I respond to it? So only this guy, which is 10.1.1.3 knows that and has to respond back. So let's see what happens. So they all, both these guys were discarded, discard the message. And this third guy, which is 
will send out the op reply back. So see, this op reply is going back and this, it will say, okay, my MAC address is CCC, whichever is this one. And then what it does, it populates the op cache so that any future um, traffic that goes and checks the op cache should straight away come to know that yes, the uh, this IP belongs to this MAC address, right? Let's play it back. So the, so PC1 encapsulates the frame and now this goes directly and it will directly go to its path, right? So it sends the reply back and you will see from request timeout, this will change to a ping. So it starts pinging, right? So that is what we wanted to show you, the importance of ARP, right guys? Let me play it one more time. I won't speak, just have a look and try and understand it. Okay, so I really just want to um, say thanks to the person who's actually created it because I haven't created it and I can't take ownership of this. Uh, it's just that I really loved the way they have explained it and that's why I wanted to use or utilize it in my um, course and that's why I've, I've actually taken this. Um, so thanks to the person who's actually created this. And uh, so in the next video, we will take a look at another very, very important uh, concept packets, network packets, how, what are network packets, how these network packets travel. Because if you are sitting in UK and you are requesting a server sitting somewhere in US, how does this network packet travel all the way from UK to the US, right? So we'll take a look, very interesting videos coming up. So keep watching. Thanks for watching. Okay, another interesting video coming your way, guys. What is a network packet? What if I tell you again that this is the backbone of the whole network, the backbone, really. If network packets are not there, today you and me or anybody else who wants to communicate on the internet, you want to view web pages, you want to do some online shopping, if this concept was not there, then trust me, we wouldn't have been able to communicate with each other right? So let's take a look. What is a network packet? So a network packet is nothing but a unit of data, right? So just think about it that you are watching a video, right? You are doing some online shopping. At the end of the day, what are we exchanging? We are exchanging data, right? Let's say there's an HTTP request you are sending to a web server uh, that, okay, I want to go to amazon.co.uk then the uh, the HTTP response is sent back by the web server, giving you the web page back. So what, what is it happening? So you are just exchanging data, but the unit of data with which the information goes is called a network packet. Very important, a network packet. A packet typically consists of a header and a payload. So just think about it very logically. We take it and we break it down. So what would a packet have? So obviously the packet needs to know from where to go and what should be the destination. So it should know about its source and it should also know about its destination. Definitely because when it reaches the destination, the destination should also know that from which source it was coming, right? So it's very important that the packet contains this information. So this is what we have. A packet will have a header, something like this, this we call a header and this we call a payload, which is the actual data, right? 
So the header contains information such as the source and destination address, right? So as I told you, you need to know what is the source address and you need to know the destination address. So in, in this case, let's say you are somewhere in India and you want to access CNN.com in US, right? So what would happen? So you would, so the packet request goes here or the packet goes from here to here and the packet goes back from here to here, right? So, but what we are saying is the header contains information such as the source IP address and the destination IP address. So in this case, my source IP address is 192.168.2.2, this one. My destination IP address is 10.10.10.7, .10 which is a website server, or you can say CNN.com, right? And it will also have a, a different other uh, things like the type or uh, the protocol that I'm using. It could be TCP and the packet sequence number because all these packets need to get together because just think about it. If you're watching a big video, so that video is first broken into packets. So all those pa packets are first broken. They go uh, to, through the destination computer. They get reassembled. That's why it's very important to know the actual uh, sequence number, right? The payload. Payload contains the actual data, right? Which is, which could be a file, it could be an email, it could be a video string. Let's say you're watching something on Netflix, right? So packets can be transmitted using various networking protocols. So here I told you that there is an example of uh, the protocol type. So here protocol type can be either TCP, which is transmission control protocol, which could be UDP, which is user data gram protocol or ICAMP, the internet control message protocol, right? So each packet is transmitted individually and may take a different path. Now, as I said, when you're sending that packet from India to US, there are chances that you could take router A, router B, router C, and from here also, it could be that you are connected to further routers, right? So R1, R2, R3. So it can always take different path because the, the ultimate aim is to reach from this server to this server and it can it make intelligent decisions or if let's say there is some problem somewhere that can bypass certain routes and it will always and it can take different path right so but they reach at the same destination and when they are coming back they reach at the same destination the receiving device reassembles the packets very important that's that's what i said let's say you are watching a video right so when you're watching a video it will come in terms of packets right so the receiving device reassembles the packets into original data stream based on the information in the packet uh, headers. So it's very important that all this information is then reassembled only then you would actually see a proper video playing in front of you. Packets are basic unit of communication in modern uh, computer networks and ability to efficiently transmit and receive packets is critical to the performance of networked applications. So what it says is, this is the basic unit of like when you are saying the basic unit of data, this is the basic unit of communication. It's, it's the basic unit on which uh, computers are talking to each other or the networks or, or uh, systems or devices are talking to each other. So it's very important uh, that you efficiently transmit and receive the packets to get the best performance. So this was more of a theoretical lesson. In the next one, I really want to show you a YouTube video, which will actually show you that if, how does this really, or how does a network tra packet travel? Let's say you're uh, sitting in um, UK and you're sending a request to server in US. How does this travel? Uh, how does the network packet travel? We'll take a look. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. Now I would like you to um, understand how a packet travels. So there's a very good video I found on YouTube, which is called a packet stale. And how does internet work? I'd like you guys to first have a look at this video and then we will go into the discussions. So I'll stay quiet for some time and I'll play the video. Have you ever wondered what happens when someone in England visits the World Science Festival's webpage? First, their computer needs to ask the World Science Festival server for a copy of that webpage. The computer sticks this request into a virtual envelope called a packet, wrapped with specific information about that request, including the World Science Festival's IP address. The computer sends this packet out of the house and below the street via large underground copper wires. It passes through small regional networks before ending up here at Telehouse North in London. 
Telehouse North is England's main internet hub. The IP address on this packet tells the hub that the World Science Festival server is actually in Los Angeles. So Telehouse North sends the packet out as light across the Atlantic, over fiber optic cables buried deep beneath the ocean. The packet ends up here, 60 Hudson Street, New York City, the largest internet hub on the East Coast. This hub sends the packet through a series of regional networks connecting New York to Los Angeles, where the World Science Festival server resides. The server reads the request and gets ready to send the web page to England. But web pages made up of images and text are too large to send as a single packet of data. So how do we get it back to England? Imagine a group of 5,000 tourists visiting New York City in a single gigantic tour bus. They are way up in Harlem, but they want to visit the Statue of Liberty before it closes. But it's rush hour on a Friday. There's no way that giant bus is going to fit through those crazy congested streets. So they decide to get off the bus and spread out. Some take the subway, some take cabs, a few rent bikes, and some even take kayaks down the Hudson River. How they get there doesn't matter, as long as they get there on time. Likewise, for the internet to work efficiently, this web page is pulverized into thousands of tiny packets of data each one wrapped with all the information it needs to rebuild itself in England. The packets are sent to LA's One Wilshire hub, which checks the traffic report before sending them off. Through miles and miles of land they travel, checking in through different hubs. Like our New York City tourists, those packets don't care how they get there, as long as they get there as fast as possible. Most of them will go through 60 Hudson in New York, where they are redirected back to England as light, riding a fiber of glass as thick as a silver dollar. Then back on copper wire through regional British networks until all the packets reach their destination and... And this epic journey, it all happens in about a second, along with trillions upon trillions of similar journeys that happen each and every day on this remarkable, easy to take for granted, network of networks we call the internet okay so i think it was a really an amazing video which actually showed you how a packet travels right so it just showed that if you are sitting in uk and you're, you're sending a request how does a packet goes with the speed of light it's going through all the cables that are even laid out under the seabed Right. So that is what we wanted to show you that how a packet travels and travels within milliseconds. It's happening all the time and we don't even realize it. Right. So a packet is created when data is sent over the network, such as Internet. The packet is given a destination address and the source address. So as we saw in the previous lecture, I showed you the architecture of a packet that it always had the header and it had a payload. In the header, we were keeping things like what is the source of IP address, what is the destination IP address, and the payload was the actual data. Now the packet is then sent to the nearest router or the gateway. So as, as they showed in the video, that the packet goes to the router. The router is like a gateway. As I showed you, the gateway will tell, okay, where do I go next? That is what the question the packet is asking the router. Hey, where do I go next? And with routers, we always use the term hop. Hop means you go from one router to another router to a third router. And same, uh, if you go back uh, by the video uh, that they showed, they showed that there were passengers traveling. Now, the, some passengers took, let's say, a subway, some passengers took a bus, some passengers started walking. So the aim was to reach at a particular destination. What route you use doesn't matter. That is the same way with how network tra packets travel. So the router checks the destination address and sends the packet to the next router in the network. So because as I said, it's always hop to hop. So the request comes to one router, the one router knows, okay, these are the paths where you can go. Then it uh, sends the request to the next router. From next router, it goes to next router until it reaches the destination. So the process continues until the package reaches its destination. And each router determines the best path for the packet based on its routing table. So as we discussed previously, every router will maintain a routing table from where it knows that, okay, which is the destination, which path do I need to take? Again, you can take different paths in, uh, let's say you are watching a video and that video is broken down into uh, millions of packets, right? 
Now, there are uh, normally what happens that each packet would be using different routes. So it's not that first packet goes or second packet goes. Uh, it, it will always go on the same path. Never it happens. It will always use different routes. It could be because of the traffic, because of any reasons you can think of due to performance reasons or due to high availability reasons that why it's taking a different route. So all different packets will take different routes, but at the end of the day, they have to get accumulated or reassembled at one end. And at each hop along the way, the packet may be buffered and queued before it can be transmitted to the next router. So it waits and then from there it goes or jumps or hops onto the next router. So router to router, router to router, router to router, the journey continues. And once the packets uh, reach its destination, it is reassembled into the original data stream and delivered to the intended recipient. Let's say you are watching a, a video on Netflix, right? So once all these packets get reassembled at your um, destination uh, or at your uh, request uh, or, or on your uh, say web browser, they, then they get displayed as a movie, as a, as a, as a video, uh, and you can, you can um, keep watching it. So uh, that is, uh, uh, I think, a pretty good uh, summary of how a packet travels. Now in next video, I will actually show a quick demo of how you can actually check uh, this based on uh, your own system. If you can, we, we, will uh, we will run a trace route and we'll see if we are trying to reach a particular website, what uh, different routers or what different uh, IP addresses or, or hops uh, a packet has to go through. Thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. So in this video, we will take a look at how a trace route works. Some people call it trace route and some people call it trace route. So here, what I want to do is I just want to do the same thing. Like uh, as I showed you the how the networks, uh, how the packets travel uh, from one location to another location. There's a very good uh, website, which is gsuite.tools. Uh, and there you can do a visual trace route. So if I just simply give cnn.com, uh, let's say I'm sitting here in UK and I'm accessing a web page or a web site or uh, which is actually sitting somewhere in US. So how would uh, this uh, routing take space? So here you can see that this clearly shows that I'm sitting in UK. If I, if I actually uh, go down, you can see I'm sitting somewhere in London and, and from my ISP it is going to um, which router then how the uh, this routing takes place it's all explained through this visual trace, trace route. So I would suggest that you guys should do it at your place as well and if you see these are all the different hops it takes place. So just imagine I told you that within it travels with the speed of light right so this request if you see from here to reaching to to US within point not point seven milliseconds we were able to do that right so uh, so uh, I would suggest just guys do it at your end as well do a trace route see how it shows if you are based in India if you are based out of US if you're trying to access a web page out there in US or some some other place then you can actually um, go through what what kind of uh, route or route your packet is taking. So uh, that's that was kind of a short video, but I just wanted to uh, share with you that this is this website. Please do sh uh, have a look. Try uh, try out your location and uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we will actually take a look at what is a VPN or a virtual private network. Very, very important concept in networking VPN. Thanks for watching. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that you would have definitely heard this term called VPN, right? Or if, if you haven't heard the term, you would actually be using this in your day to day um, life. And a, the perfect example that I normally give is let's say if you are in IT and you're supporting a client who is in US and you're let's say sitting in India and you have to support this um, client environment in US, you would actually be connecting through a VPN to uh, the client's network or the client's uh, environments, right? So you'd always be using a VPN. So, but what is a VPN? Let's take a look. So VPN stands for a virtual private network. So if we divide it, we are saying it's a virtual, virtual because we are not physically laying any cables here, right? So it's a virtual network and it is private. Why private? Because it's just between these two devices with, with between which you are setting up the uh, network. And, and normally we always use the concept called tunnel. We always say this is a tunnel. So if you see, this is, this is a kind of a tunnel we have created between two devices, which means that's a private connection between these two devices. Nobody can just jump in or start tempering the packets in this, this network because it's 
all encrypted and it's just between these two devices or uh, you can say this is a router or a cpe on this side which is which we call a customer premise equipment and there's a router on this side and in between these two uh, um, uh, routers we are creating this kind of a tunnel right so it's a technology which is used to create secure and private connection very important it is secure it's always considered to be secure because your packets are uh, actually all encrypted or this this tunnel as we call it is a secure tunnel and it's all encrypted and it's a private connection right it's 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 although it is going uh, over the internet but it is private to you if you see it is going over the internet but if I remove this tunnel, then anybody can come and um, start sniffing your packets, right? So, but, but if you start creating a VPN tunnel, then it's only the traffic between these two devices. VPNs are commonly used to protect the sensitive uh, data and communication from unauthorized access, interception, tampering. So as I said, you can't go and temper uh, and you are protecting your sensitive data. As I said, let's say you are sitting somewhere here in India and you are accessing the customer environment in US, right? So you are actually protecting that sensitive data, right? So, and that is quite important. VPNs encrypt all data transmitted between devices. So as I said, um, the uh, this whole tunnel, it's always running encrypted traffic. So they will, VPN will encrypt all data transmitted between devices, making it unreadable for anyone to intercept. So if, if a hacker just uh, tries and uh, sniffs this, they won't be able to see anything, right? Because it's all encrypted. VPNs use tunneling protocols. So there are quite a few tunneling protocols that are available in the market. Uh, one is PP2, uh, PPTP, which is point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. The other is L2TP, which stands for layer two tunneling protocol. Then there is open VPN, and then there is IPsec VPN. IPsec VPN is quite popular uh, with uh, cloud vendors. Uh, we call it the internet protocol security uh, secure uh, VPN. And it helps to create a secure connection between devices. The aim is still the same. So VPNs allow remote workers to securely access corporate networks and resources from outside companies' physical premises. So as I gave you the example of India and US, let's say you are a resource based out of India and you are supporting the clients in US. So you can use it through a VPN, right? Because it will allow remote workers to securely access the corporate network. VPNs use the used to bypass dual uh, restrictions now and it can also allow you to access certain blogged websites now there can be certain websites which are region based right uh, so let's say uh, if I get, take you an example like th there are certain sites like makemytrip.com which is an India uh, based website now if you try to open that um, website in a European region uh, it won't work they'll say that uh, you are you are out of the region or there are certain um, say other other uh, company um, sites which are based on the geo restrictions so you can bypass the geo restrictions through VPN as well but you have to be very careful if you're doing it there should be certain reason for doing it and uh, so it's, it's just for educational purposes I'm telling you that VPNs can be used to bypass the geo restrictions and even access the block websites right so VPNs can be deployed using dedicated hardware devices uh, uh, or cloud-based. So very important. So in an enterprise, if you are implementing a VPN, you would actually be using routers. Okay. And if, um, if we are talking about a more a home network or something, then you would be using more software-based VPNs, something like a Nord VPN. Right. So uh, th there are a lot of other um, uh, VPNs that are available in the market, but I'm just giving you an example, uh, which is um, like quite popular these days. It's a Nord VPN. Now, uh, since we've got a good understanding of VPN in the next video, I want to show you a demo of how VPN actually works. We will actually uh, take a look at a Nord VPN. And as I said, you can use really any VPN, but uh, we will uh, take a look at NordVPN and what it does, how it will, you will see hide my IP address, whatever uh, IP address is available publicly to uh, people, to hackers, it will actually hide my um, location as well. So uh, keep watching. Let's uh, see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. This is going to be a very, very interesting demo on VPN. And we are talking here about more of software based VPNs or cloud based VPNs, you can call it that way. Because I told you that VPN is normally you, it can be either hardware based, which would be more of like you're putting a router 
or it could be software based like you are using a software so i'm i'm, I'm just uh, on the nordvpn website if you actually log into that and it's a real website and where you can actually read about it right you can see what it says what is a vpn it says vpn stands for virtual private network it's a service that gives you safe and private access to the internet right whatever we studied by encrypting your connection vpn hides your ip very important it is hiding your ip so the hacker can't really um, uh, go and attack you because the hacker even doesn't know your uh, real location and online activity from spying eyes and keeps your data safe from cyber criminals so it just tells about why not vpn what are the available uh, what all is available for your devices if you are it's windows based mac based linux android everything is is actually available and you can do safe browsing you can have password security you can encrypt your files so all that stuff is there but okay let's try and understand the importance of this so the thing is that uh, there is uh, if if on google i do what is my ip address you'll see it it's actually publicly showing my current ip address that where i'm based if i actually go to another uh, location what is my ip address.com it will actually clearly tell me that okay i'm based out of london i i'm actually this is my uh, exact location if i drill down it can actually give me more details really a lot of details which you wouldn't like that a hacker should know right so this is where a, a thing like nord vpns really comes handy so what we'll do is we will uh, we will call this nord vpn and the, the good thing about this is that you can pick any country right from 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 nord vpn let's say i connect to czech republic right or i i can connect to estonia i can connect to finland let's pick finland um so now i'm connected to finland right so it's it's basically the vpn is active now so what if i go and do what is my ip address right so you'll see my ip address is suddenly changed right and if i go to what is my ip address.com you'll see that it is actually changed although i am based right now out of london but it is showing me that i am based somewhere in helsinki finland do do you do you see the importance do you see the beauty of vpn what it does so it's clearly hiding my real identity on the internet it's very important so apart from whatever we studied in terms of security i would say a vpn really really protects you because otherwise if you see it was giving me giving you the exact details where i am based from where i am recording this right everything was there on the internet any hacker can actually attack me or tomorrow attack you guys because your uh, your public ip address is available on the internet right so but as soon as i use the vpn it's suddenly just hidden everything it's showing the hacker that oh i'm somewhere based out of helsinki finland let him go and attack the finland ip address right so that's the importance of um, a vpn so i hope you like the video thanks for watching hello folks welcome back I hope you are enjoying your journey to learning the foundations of cybersecurity. So another key concept that we'll be looking at is a firewall. Now the question arises what is a firewall? I can tell you honestly that it is one of the most important concepts in network security or cybersecurity, especially for enterprise customers. And you will always see that the enterprise customers will always have a firewall in place now if we really start from the word firewall what is a wall right let's say if you build a wall normally why would you build a wall right you would build a wall for security i'm talking about a about your house right so our house has uh, let's say walls and and this is why we are building it just for security right otherwise you could be just li living without walls so it's just to ensure that nobody from outside can just straight away barge into your house or come into your house same is a concept for networks and and the other thing about wall is that you are protecting whatever is going outside and whatever is coming inside basically you are in control right so anything that is coming from outside or anything that is going from, uh, from coming from outside or going from inside you are in control and that's the whole concept how a firewall works so firewall is a network security device or a software very important so 
A firewall can be either a hardware firewall or it can be a software based firewall, which monitors and controls the incoming and outgoing network traffic. So as I explained you in a wall, the wall of a house, you are in control, whatever is going outside or whatever is coming inside. Same way, if you see here, you have a PC here and you are connected to internet. So in between, you are keeping a firewall. So whatever is going out and whatever is coming in, it's going via the firewall. So you are in control, right? If let's say if this firewall was not there, you could have easily um, reached out to internet or uh, any malicious packets could have arrived from internet over to you. So no packet inspection would take place uh, if the firewall is not there, right? So it's very important that you control the incoming and the outgoing network traffic. And it acts as a barrier, right? So just like a wall, just like a wall, it acts as a barrier between a trusted internal network and untrusted external network like internet. So here I'm talking about, let's say you work for a bank, right? This is a trusted network. You are sitting in a trusted network. And here we are talking about an uh, about internet, right? Which is kind of untrusted. The hackers can be there. So this guy sitting here, the dark web can be there. Like everything is there, which is trying to reach out to you. So that's why we say it acts as a barrier between the trusted internal network and untrusted external network. They work by enforcing a set of predefined rules or policies that determine which network traf traffic is allowed or uh, blocked. So here what we do is we normally put some kind of policies here on either it's a if, if it's a hardware based firewall or it's a software based firewall you would always uh, put some policies or you can put some rules you can define some rules that okay you need to adhere to these rules so um, firewalls can filter the traffic based on the factors such as source uh, ip destination ip port numbers protocols so there's a lot of ways in which you can control the traffic Sometimes you would see that uh, the, uh, the, uh, they will block access to porn websites, right? Because uh, the people um, or, or the organizations don't want people to visit these kind of websites or uh, uh, any other malicious, um, say, um, uh, say websites um, you, you are protected from or you are actually kind of blocked from. So this can all be done based on the destination IP address. You can give the uh, URL of that website. Okay, I want this to be blocked. You can define port numbers that if any request comes from this port number or if it tries to reach to a certain port number or certain protocols that you would like to um, uh, drop. So you could, you could drop access to ping. You don't want people to ping you on that so you can always um, drop on, on, on that uh, ICMP protocol right so there are two main types of firewalls hardware firewalls and software firewalls we already talked about that so hardware firewalls are usually deployed at a network parameter we'll, we'll look uh, at what is the network parameter but just think about it that wherever you are connected to internet you don't connect to internet directly you would always there would always be in uh, a firewall in between you and the internet so it's always deployed to protect protect for to uh, for protection and uh, for protection of multiple devices so software firewalls are installed on individual devices. So what we can do is we can even define a firewall on, uh, it can define uh, be defined at OS level as well. So you, you, you can actually define at the host level. So software firewalls are installed on individual devices and provide protection at device level. So very important, so when, when you're talking about the software, uh, you are actually doing at device level. But when you're uh, talking about a hardware firewall, then you're talking about enterprise level or you can say multiple devices are protected okay so you're protecting multiple devices but software firewall normally uh, let's say you have your os you or you install some software you install a firewall on your uh, machine so you are just protecting that device so firewalls can prevent unauthorized, uh, unauthorized access malware infections data breaches because they block the malicious traffic quite understandable and firewalls play a crucial role in maintaining the security and integrity of computer networks. So they say that if you really want your whole network to be really secure and you want to maintain the integrity of your computer networks so that nobody is going, coming, no hackers are coming and tampering with your networks, then you really need to have a firewall in place 
With this, we come to the end of the video. In the next video or lecture, we will talk about a proxy server. What is a proxy server? Another key concept in enterprise networks. What is a proxy server? So keep watching. Thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. So after having a look at what is a firewall, it's time to take a look at what is a proxy server. Now, a question that is asked is what is proxy first of all, right? So I always say that it's always good to look at the English term. So in English, if you look at proxy, if you just forget about networking or you forget about science for the moment and just focus on English, what is the meaning of the word proxy? The proxy meaning the word of the meaning of the word proxy is it is the authority to represent someone else, which means that let's say I have to go somewhere and I can't attend that event. So if I delegate that authority to somebody else, somebody else would be going on my behalf and attending that event. So that is what you mean by proxy. And that's the same concept that we have adopted in network security that you place a proxy server. So if you see here, we have placed a proxy server. So this proxy server is kind of delegated fr from the client. So the client itself is delegated. Let's say the client needs to connect to internet. So right now when you're sitting in your home network, you would just simply be directly connecting to internet. No issues, right? But just think about the enterprise networks, big banks, financial companies, they can't let their clients or they can't let their um, people directly connect to the internet. That's why they bring the concept of proxy server. And whenever you have to connect to internet, you have to go via the proxy server, right? So let's say you have a host and you want that host or let's say you have a Linux machine and when you want that Linux machine to be connected to internet, you always go via the proxy. Right. So as I said, you are delegating the authority to represent yourself so that this client has delegated this authority to the proxy server. And when, when you're talking to Internet, the Internet thinks, OK, I'm talking to this client, but it's actually this proxy server you are talking to. And the proxy server then sends the request over to the to the client back. So let's take a look. So a proxy server is an intermediary between the client and server. So if you see, this is the client and the server it, 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 between, let's say, client and the internet, it is acting as an intermediary, right? So it forwards the request from the client to server and returns the response from server to client. So if you see you are forwarding the request to the proxy, proxy is then forwarding it, let's say over to internet, and then the response comes back and the response comes back to you. So it, it's, it acts as a uh, kind of a intermediary, which is taking the request and bringing the response and giving the response back to the client. It helps to improve the performance. It helps to enhance privacy and it also provides additional security features. And we will take a look why we are saying it. So what happens is that the, uh, the proxy server uses a concept of caching. So caching means that it's actually storing a lot of um, say um, websites uh, that you've already visited. So because of that, because of that caching, uh, or cache, you the proxy server doesn't have to go to the internet again and again. So you don't have to make uh, these round trips to the internet. So that's what it says by caching, you can improve the performance by reducing the amount of data that needs to be transmitted over the network. Because if the, those websites or those URLs are already in the cache, then proxy server doesn't have to go to the internet and get this response. First send the request, get the re uh, response back. So it's, it's definitely reducing the network traffic. It enhances the privacy by masking the IP address. So now, as I told you, every client or every host would have an IP address, right? So if there is a hacker sitting here, then the hacker wouldn't come to know the IP address of this because this is actually masking it, right? So we are masking the IP address of this client and the hacker won't come to know because the hacker can only reach the proxy server. It, it won't have any visibility of this client, right? And this proxy server itself is taking care of all the all the packets that are coming and it can inspect those packets as well. And obviously you would have firewalls in place as well, right? So it helps with content filtering and malware scanning. So if, if uh, let's say a hacker is trying to send you some malware or it's um, uh, it can even, um, so the proxy server can even uh, do the content filtering for you. Like we uh, call it the uh, packet inspection. You can inspect the packets, whether they are coming from the authorized source or not. 
right proxy servers can block malicious con content um, so as i said uh, that you can it prevents you from um, malware phishing scams and other forms of cyber attacks as well so it's very important uh, to have a proxy server uh, in place and uh, we do have a concept of uh, reverse proxy servers as well now here we are uh, talking about a client all the time like you guys you're sitting in a bank you're working on um, or talking to internet but just think about the web servers right just think about those web servers which are actually prone to attacks as well and the biggest attack that web servers are prone to is ddos attacks which we learned in very early in, in our lessons so the ddos is denial of a service attack or distributed denial, denial of service attacks where a lot of requests are coming onto this web server to overwhelm the in the traffic or to overwhelm the web server with with a lot of traffic so that is where it says that if you have a reverse proxy server then it can actually protect your web server as well same way you are uh, the hacker can't reach the web server the hacker will have to go via the proxy server and they can't directly attack a web server so it helps to prevent the attacks such as distributed denial of service attacks and obviously it's it's quite important um, that it can be used for forensics and so like as as you you have forensics in normal case like where is a mur where a murder happens or where there is um, some some illegal activity then the forensics comes or there's a robbery the forensics comes to check uh, to tra check the traces of what has gone wrong same way in network security cyber security we have a concept of forensic analysis right you would have to check what has gone wrong who was trying to um, barge into your network at that time we so this is normally in computers will always check through the monitoring and through through the log activity so proxy servers again help you to monitor and log the network activity which actually provides a lot of valuable information for forensic analysis so i believe now you got a very good understanding of what a proxy server is what is a firewall it's time to take a look at what is a dmz <laughs> very important concept again in cybersecurity, you will see a lot of PMs, a lot of network guys talking all the time about your DMZs. What are DMZs? We'll take a good look in the next video. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. It's time to take a look at another interesting concept called DMZ. Right? You would have definitely heard this term uh, DMZ wherever your security folks are talking or your network admins are talking to each other. Now, what exactly is DMZ? Before understanding that, I think it's important to look at a bit of a history to understand from where we got this term, right? So it all actually started back in year, I would say 1953, when we were having the Korean War between North Korea and South Korea. So when the war ended, they came up with a strip of land that served as a buffer zone. So if you see this, this orange bit, this is the stretch of land or they also used to call it a buffer zone where no military activity can take place. So you have soldiers here, you have soldiers here, but no soldier can actually come in this, this kind of zone, which is a buffer zone. And this they call it as a demilitarized zone, DMC. So what our network folks have done, they have adopted this concept of DMZ and implemented it in network security. So let's take a look how it works. So a DMZ, as I said, stands for demilitarized zone. As you can see, this stretch of land, oh, and we call it a buffer zone. So it says it's a network security concept that involves creating a buffer zone. Same way, like you're creating a buffer zone between the internet and the organization's internal network, right? So as we have uh, this between North Korea and South Korea, same way we are saying we are creating a buffer zone between the internet and the organization's internal network. So the DMZ typically contains services that are accessible from the internet, such as web servers, email servers, FTP servers, right? Now, if you want to really understand it, the best way to look at is, is this diagram. So let's say this is your public internet and this is your public facing resources. When I say public facing resources, these could be your web servers, right? And when I say private, uh, private sources, I could say a database server. It could be a database server. It could be your clients, right? All of them are sitting here. 
So what are we doing in a DMZ is we are creating this entire buffer zone, if you see this. And this entire buffer zone is created by having, let's say, firewalls in place. You can have proxy servers. So whatever concepts we already learned about firewalls, about proxy servers, this is that area where we would be keeping it. But have a look. What we do is, first of all, we place a firewall between the public internet and the public facing resources. So let's say you have uh, web servers, which are public facing, right? Anybody can go uh, on the internet and uh, log on to those, those websites, those URLs. So they are public facing. So what are we doing? We are actually placing a firewall in between, which is called a parameter firewall, right? So you're placing a par parameter firewall. So whatever we learned about firewall, you are doing the packet inspection, you are blocking malicious traffic, all that is happening here, right? So the traffic comes here and then before it actually reaches your private resources like data database servers, your specific clients, again, we put another firewall, which we call the internal firewall. So the first filtration takes place here, the second filtration takes place here, and then the traffic comes and, and reaches the database servers or the private resources or the clients. So just look at it, how secure we are making our uh, network uh, here, because if we just get rid of these firewalls, anybody could have easily reached the internet and the malicious traffic could have come inside or um, say uh, the the websites that should have been blocked would, would be accessible as well. So that's, that's where this DMZ or demilitarized zone is very important. So that's what it says. It is an additional layer of security by separating these publicly accessible services from the internal network where sensitive data and critical resources are stored. So this is our area where sensitive data, because it's database servers are there, our clients are there, all the um, sensitive data is stored here. And as I already told you, it's implemented using firewalls. So you are implementing multiple firewalls, proxy servers on uh, and other ne network security devices to control the flow of data between internet and the DMZ. Right. Uh, quite important. A poorly designed DMZ can cr create security vulnerabilities. Ov obviously, right? If, if you are um, not designing your DMZ in a particular way, then you are creating holes here, right? So anybody could um, go, go through your network and, in, on, and go on to your database servers or clients as well. So it's very important that a careful design is done for these DMZs. Um, DMZs are commonly used in enterprise networks data centers. So uh, it's something that you won't see in, in your home network, right? It, it is normally big enterprises, big banks, um, um, I would say financial companies, uh, they would be using uh, uh, DMZs and even the cloud vendors, Oracle, A Amazon, uh, AWS, um, Azure, they would be having DMZs in their data centers as well, right? And, and also some uh, web hosting environments. So DMZs can help to optimize the network performance, obviously, because if, if let's say we, it was not there, all the filtration that is happening here, all the in packet inspection that is happening here, and also that is uh, happening here would put a lot of um, traffic or uh, the direct traffic would go on to the uh, private resources. So that's why it's very important that it can help you to optimize the network performance because it offloads the traffic that would have otherwise been directed to internal network. So you're offloading that traffic, you're taking care of those uh, filtrations here itself before it actually hits your internal network. So I think by now you've got a very, very good understanding of what is a DMZ. So thanks for watching guys. Hello and welcome. So one of the key protocols that we study is SSH. So SSH is a kind of protocol that you that comes into picture whenever you are uh, talking uh, to uh, a client and a server. So let's say you are uh, you are let's say sitting on a Mac system or a Windows system and you need to connect to a host probably it could be a Linux host that you have created uh, in, in the cloud. So it could be that you have created a cloud machine uh, in AWS, Azure, Oracle Cloud, and you want to connect to this uh, machine uh, if, uh, from your uh, client. So what protocol do we use? So we use an SSH protocol here. So what does SSH stand for? So the, the SSH stands for the secure shell. So uh, S stands for secure and SH stands for shell. Right. So it's, it's quite important protocol if you are actually connecting to your uh, Unix machines. Okay. 
and uh, it's a we, we say it's a cryptographic network uh, networking protocol right it enables secure communication and data exchange between two computers over an unsecured network so as i said uh, it enables secure communication so this protocol will help you uh, to connect to another machine so because th there is no other way how how would you connect and the important thing here is it needs to be secure communication what mean what it means is that uh, the the data in transit is is also encrypted. So whatever um, uh, connection you are making should be a secure uh, connection and should be a secure communication. Just just think about it that you are a DBA or you are a system administrator and you need to manage your resources. So you need to connect to the client's computers from from your existing machine or, or normally we say a jump server, right? So you need to use the SSH or secure shell uh, to, to connect to it. And SSH is often used for remote access. So quite important, very important word is remote access. So your, um, uh, let's say it's a physical server sitting somewhere in the data center. Now you need to access that. How would you access over the internet or how would you access over your network or, or your VPN? So you have to remotely access it. So there are two ways. Either you physically go and uh, visit your client site or physically uh, go to the data center or you can remotely access it. And it's not only access, but it's also the administration of the computers and servers where we use the SSH protocol. And very, very important thing that SSH encrypts the data during transmission. So we are talking about data in transit encryption and it prevents eavesdropping. So what was eavesdropping? I told you that in eavesdropping, you, the hacker can either intercept, delete or modify, modify the messages or the transmission. So SSH is a kind of a protocol which uh, helps to encrypt the data during transmission and it prevents eavesdropping. Um, users can securely log into the remote computer using SSH with e either username password or public private key pair. So it, it's more of uh, to understand that you let's say you have a Linux machine and that you created a test user, right? And this is your uh, own PC, right? This is your PC and you want to access using SSH. So what you need to do is uh, either you should know the uh, username password for this user, right? For the test user, if you are doing an SSH from here to here, or there is a com uh, there is a concept of public private key pair. What we've already learned, like so, you would have a public key and you would have a secret key. So secret key stays here and the public key gets transferred in the authorized files of this computer. So because of this, you can easily do an SSH and you can give um, say something like um, say root at and give the um, say uh, the name of this machine. So something like Linux 12C, right? So th th this is how we access it. So it says there are two ways is to securely uh, log in. Either you can uh, use a username password. Yes, if you know the uh, username and password like test and the password for this, or there is a mechanism of public private key pair where the public private key pair will be. Um, uh, so in, in this case, your um, private key stays uh, on the client side and on the on the server side, you'd be copying or you will have a copy of your public key so that this handshake can easily take place. So SSH uh, operates on the port 22 by default. So that if, you, if somebody asks you what is the default port for uh, uh, SSH, the, the SSH works on the port 22 by default. So SSH key pairs consist of private key, which is kept secret and the public key, which is shared with server. So as I just explained here, so you will have a public private key pair. So the key, secret key or the private key stays um, uh, or is kept secret and it is used to log into the uh, servers and the public key is actually um, shared with the servers. The public key is used to authenticate the user while a private key remains on the user's device. So as, as we explained here, the private key stays here, right? But the public key is um, is actually uh, spread across or, or actually actually copied to uh, the uh, the server. Um, normally, there's a file called authorized underscore keys where you would actually keep uh, your um, public key. And this is actually used to authenticate the user. Right. And um, quite important, um, if, if you are looking for uh, an open source version of um, SSH, then open SSH. You can always download it. You can it's easily available on the Internet. Open SSH is a widely used open source implementation of SSH. So, guys, um, just to quickly summarize, SSH stands for secure shell. It's basically a it's a secure shell that you're getting uh, on a computer. So if you see here, you are a client and you need to um, connect to a remote computer. We would say you are connecting to a remote computer uh, 
through this secure shell right so it's it's quite important uh, that how uh, you use it as I explained either you can use it um, through a password mechanism or the the recommended way is the public private key pair where private key stays on your uh, client computer and the public key is actually shared uh, with the server and with this it helps you to uh, have a good uh, proper handshake and the public key is used to authenticate the user while the private key remains on the user's device so with this, we come to the end of the video. Thanks for watching. Okay, after taking a look into the previous SSH protocol, it's time to take a look into TCP IP. Now guys, when we actually studied uh, the networking lecture, in that we studied about the OSI model, right? So TCP IP model is a more practical model that addresses the communication challenges that relies on the standard protocols. But OSI itself is a comprehensive protocol independent framework. And if you see the number of layers as compared to the OSI model are much less. As you can see, there are normally we just keep around four layers. The, the, very, um, the bottom layer, we call it the network access layer, which controls the hardware component of the network. Like in, in OSI, you might remember there was a physical layer, there was a data link layer. In, there's, in, in this case, it's more abstracted, right? So we have much less layers, as you can see. Then comes the internet layer, which determines the path in the network. Like if you talk about the routers, what, what, uh, what path does your network packet take? Then uh, we talk about the transport layer, which supports the communication between diverse devices and networks and definitely the application layer which we also call the presentation layer so what is tcp ip so tcp ip is nothing but it's a set of networking protocols protocol is nothing but set of rules and it governs the communication and the data exchange between within the computer networks so i always say that it is actually the backbone of today's networking this tcp ip right and as you can see the, it's actually uh, formed of two words tcp and ip and we'll take a look into each of these right so as i said it's formed of two core protocols tcp and ip now what does tcp stand for so the tcp stands for transmission control protocol so t is transmission C control and P protocol. What it does is it provides reliable connection oriented data transmission, which ensures data integrity and error handling. So, so the whole concept is that if you, uh, there shouldn't be any kind of tempering of data happening or the data that you requested, if it is not coming in the right form, then it shouldn't be uh, made available to you. Like, like we saw the example of um, as a client server, you are accessing a website, you're, you're watching a video on Netflix. So as I told you that the packets, they all first get accumulated. Once they are accumulated, then they are actually presented to you, right? So it's very important that error connect, error checking and um, packet switching uh, takes place at all, all, all this um, entire journey of the packets, right? Same way we have the IP. Now IP stands for internet protocol, which manages the addressing and routing of data packets between devices on a network. Now this, this is actually based on the IP addresses. Now, uh, as I told you, every, uni every computer or every host on the network has a unique address, which is called an IP address. So this protocol helps you to manage the addressing and routing of data packets. So as, as we saw that a packet can take different routes, as, as, as we uh, saw in the example where uh, the people were trying to reach to a specific place in, in US. Some uh, took the subway, some took the tram, some took the bus, right? But they all had to reach at one uh, possible destination or, or one uh, distinct destination. Same way the packets have know that they have to reach at a specific place, but they can take different routes. And this internet protocol, um, uh, protocol it's, it's actually managing your addressing and routing. So two important concepts come here, packet switching, which I already talked about. It's nothing but where TCP IP breaks the data into smaller packets for efficient transmission. Same way, which we showed you earlier, you had a Netflix video, you can't simply just play a Netflix video. So when the server sends it, the server will actually send it in millions of packets. And it and all these packets will start traveling from US, let's say coming all the way to, to UK, right? They will take, take different routes. They will go through hop by hop, hop by hop. They will choose different routers. 
and as as it says these packets travel independently across the network and are reassembled at the destination right so this is tcp ip then uh, the next concept all part of tcp ip which we studied uh, more of ip is its uh, addressing right as i said the devices on tcp ip network are assigned ip addresses we, which we told you that every host on the network will have a unique ip address so this is where addressing comes into picture and we did discuss that there are two types of uh, addressing mechanisms ipv4 and ipv6 so now you would have noticed that a lot of cloud vendors are actually increasing the price of the ipv4 public ip addresses because the number of public ip addresses that are available is reducing so that's why they really want the companies or people to start migrating to the newer form of a uh, newer version of ip addressing which is ipv6 right so with this we come to the end of the um, lecture on TCP IP. I believe you've got good understanding of what is TCP IP. We break the TCP IP into two protocols, TCP protocol, which is more of for providing a connection oriented data transmission, which ensures data integrity, error handling, and the IP part is more for the addressing and routing of data packets. So thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. After taking a look into what is SSH and what is TCP IP, it's time to take a look into another important type of protocol, which is SSL. And guys, I always say SSL is the backbone for secure communication over the internet. So if, F if SSL or HTTPS was not there, you and me wouldn't have actually gone to amazon.co.uk, hsbc.co.uk, or any uh, shopping website and use your credit card details. Why? Because now we know that we are on a secure channel, right? Because it's it's all encrypted. When we are talking to a server, like say when, when you're talking to amazon.co.uk or when you're talking to mintra.com, you know that the traffic is, is encrypted and it's all thanks to SSL, right? Let's take a look what is SSL. So SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, SSL, Secure Socket Layer. It's a cryptography protocol that provides secure communication over internet. And the good thing is whatever I'll go through it, it will be so easy for you guys now because we have studied everything what we will talk about in depth. So I, now I just don't need to go into too much depth. I'll just mention it and you can go back to your previous lessons and you those things would be fresh in your mind because we've done really deep dive on those. So it's, it's commonly used to establish a secure communication between users, web browser and website server. So as, as we said, you are um, sitting on a client here and let's say you are accessing HSBC or Mintra.com, right? So uh, you are basically reaching a server here, right? So you are reaching a server or a web server, right? So it is establishing a secure connection between users web browser and the web server. So all this communication that is taking place back and forth is secure. Uh, how it is secure? We say it, there, there's a concept of encryption. So SSL will encrypt the data exchange between the users browser and server, which ensures sensitive information remains confidential. So this entire traffic is encrypted. So if, if a man in the middle comes or if a hacker comes here, right? So the hacker won't see anything because it's all encrypted. We are also maintaining data integrity. As I said, that data integrity means that if you are sending the data, the data is in the same form, origi original form. So nobody is actually, or a man in the middle is not changing or amending the data, right? So this is uh, what we get with SSL. Thanks to SSL again, that you are getting data integrity of the transmitted data because the data is not being tra um, ta altered or tra uh, tampered. Uh, we get authentication. So how do we get authentication? Because SSL helps you to verify the identity of a website server and assuring that the users that they are communicating with the intended website. So what it means is that when you are accessing hsbc.co.uk, you have that peace of mind that yes, you are actually accessing hsbc.co.uk and not actually talking to a hacker somewhere sitting in the dark web. 
this is all again thanks to the authentication provided by SSL, right? And we have studied all these concepts at depth, uh, in depth, uh, when we looked at previous lessons, encryption, data integrity, authentication, non-repudiation, we all looked at all this. Oh yes, digital certificates. Again, so we again studied digital certificates a lot. So again, SSL comprises of digital certificates. So SSL relies on the digital certificates issued by the trusted authority, which is the trusted authority. Do you remember? Yes, we call it a CA or the certificate authority. Uh, so any example you remember? Yes, DigiCert, yes. So these certificates contain server's public key. As, as we told you that uh, whenever a server um, has to, let's say HSBC has to get a certificate, they'll go to the CA and um, give their public key. Uh, on top of it, they will give all their identity information as well because this uh, CA or the RA will be checking its um, uh, all the identity related information as well. And uh, SSL and HTTPS are the two terms that are uh, that can be used uh, in conjunction. So SSL is commonly used in conjunction with HTTPS. So if either you say HTTPS or you say SSL, it's one and the same thing. Uh, so HTTPS stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure because there is um, HTTP which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So what that protocol says is it's how you can actually communicate over the internet between the web browser and the web server. But when we add an S, we are talking about SSL or HTTPS, which is a secure version of standard HTTP protocol. And very important, the URL scheme, right? The websites that use uh, SSL or TLS will always have HTTPS, very important. Um, so if you are not having HTTPS or if you're just going uh, HTTP, although in today's world, you shouldn't be having HTTP websites because it means if you're having an HTTP website, what it means is that any hacker can stiff the data. They can uh, see the data because the data would be traveling in plain text. You wouldn't want that. That's why it's very important that your uh, website should be using HTTPS, which ensures that it is a secure connection. And another thing we saw in previous videos was a padlock icon. Always see, always remember that this is the kind of icon uh, that you will see. Maybe it was not a good drawing. So yeah, something like this, a padlock icon, a lock kind of icon comes uh, on the on the website, which actually shows on the address bar, which shows that it is a it is a secure communication, right? And very, very important thing. And we will see in, in the next video as well, what is TLS and uh, difference between SSL and TLS, but just try to understand that uh, TLS is actually a newer version of SSL because there were so many vulnerabilities that uh, the uh, the scientists uh, discovered or the cyber security professionals discovered in SSL that they discontinued using SSL and started calling it TLS. But as such, it is an evolution of SSL, which we call TLS, which is a transport layer security. So SSL has gone through several versions, including SSL 2.0, 3.0, and TLS, right? So now in TLS, the newest version is TLS 1.3. So previously it was TLS 1.2, now it's TLS 1.3. And TLS has largely replaced SSL due to security vulnerabilities in the older SSL version. So as I explained it to you, TLS is nothing but newer version of SSL because SSL had lots of, um, uh, say, vulnerabilities uh, figured out in that. So that's why the cybersecurity professionals started using TLS, which is transport layer security. And in TLS, the latest version is 1.3. In the next video, I'll actually show you, um, um, there's a SSL Labs a website in which we can show the usage of SSL, how, how many um, websites all over the world are using SSL, how many are using TLS, within TLS 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. We'll, we'll do a quick demo. So thanks for watching. Welcome to a very interesting demo on the usage of SSL versus TLS. So all you need to do is just go to ssllabs.com and there is a website which actually says that SSL Pulse is a continuous and global dashboard for monitoring the quality of SSL versus TLS support over the time. And 
they are talking about 150,000 SSL and TLS enabled websites, which is based on Alexa's list of most popular websites. So there is a, a list of most popular websites and this is what SSL Pulse does. It does a scan of all those sites and based on that, it collects the data and gives you on a dashboard. And this is very interesting uh, things uh, that it will tell you. If you see, it says that a number of total sites that it surveyed was around 135,000. And there were still a lot of websites, if you see around 51,599 sites were there which were having inadequate security, which means either they were not using the right protocol or the key uh, length uh, that they were using for their encryption was too small. So there could be several reasons for that. And based on that, it actually gives uh, the, uh, every site some kind of a, a ranking that whether you are in the A plus category, you are in A or A minus category. So if you see around 60, one uh, percent of the sites were actually in A category and uh, around 35.8 percent of them were in B category but still guys still today it's we are talking about something 2023 and st still there are so many websites which are actually in C D and even F category right these could be the websites which are not even using secure socket layers um, th they are actually using something like an H HTTP mechanism uh, then it actually also tells you uh, the certificate chains. It shows, okay, 98% of the sites have complete certificate chains. So you, you might remember we studied the certificate chains where there is a top down up, um, from, from the top CA, you have the intermediate CA, and then you have the actual um, web server, right? So, and, and but there are something, uh, something like 2,498 um, websites, which are still having incomplete certificate chains, which is a big vulnerability in the security of the website right same way it shows the protocol support so if you see here if you see look at the graphs it actually indicates that people are still using ssl 2.0 3.0 which has been deprecated a while back but most of the websites if you see 99.9% .9 of the sites that were surveyed were using tls 1.2 and ideally, if you ask me today, they should be on TLS 1.3 protocol because it's the newest and more secure protocol as compared to TLS 1.2. So there should be a transition from TLS 1.2 to TLS 1.3. The other interesting thing that they show is uh, the good thing, actually, I would say a lot of websites are actually using the 2048 key length for uh, the the um, the um, encryption, right? That, that is what we studied when we were uh, learning about encryption. But there are certain sites which are using 3072, which is a bigger key length, which is always good. And if you see here, uh, it also says which is the best protocol support. So if you see the transition is more towards TLS 1.3. So the aim uh, of um, the these cybersecurity professionals is that this graph should go and be on the lower side and TLS 1.3 should be on a higher side. So more websites should start utilizing TLS 1.3, right? And rest are more uh, related to extended validation certificates, what kind of attacks um, uh, the, uh, these websites are prone to. So you can al always go through it. And yeah, another interesting one is what kind of certificate signature algorithms most sites are using. The good thing is that 95.8% are using the SHA-256 hashing algorithm. And some are actually even using a higher algorithm, which is SHA-512, but most of uh, them are using the SHA-256. So yeah, guys, um, you can always have a look, play around with it. And uh, the good thing about this is you can even go back in time. So if you really want to go back, um, say several years back, keep clicking keep clicking and you you can even go several years i, I believe it, it takes data for several years let's say uh, if we are um, using a time machine and we're back in say year 2016 how did it look like so you see there is a transition that has happened right and now i'm talking about 2016 data and at that time there were there were a lot of uh, websites which were in f so and if you look at the protocol support at that time tls 1.3 was not even there so which actually shows you that uh, 2023 
1.3 TLS uh, is 1.3 is a newer protocol right and, and at that time the best protocol support was TLS 1.2 right and at that time uh, the uh, key length was still 2048 so lots of changes have happened so people are moving in the right direction if you see these graphs uh, were were um, these graphs have really gone down so there are more sites that have come up in the A category and less sites are in F and D category right so yeah you can always play around with this data look around this website and it would be good learning for you to good get a good uh, uh, understanding of SSL TLS some comparisons in the next uh, lesson we'll actually do some uh, further theoretical comparisons between SSL and TLS thanks for watching Oh, this, this would be a short and crisp comparison between SSL and TLS. So we already talked about SSL and TLS a bit, but this one will give you a quick comparison uh, between SSL and TLS. So SSL or the secure socket layer was developed by Netscape, right? You might remember um, there was a Netscape navigator web browser. It's It's been ages back, uh, Netscape was very po popular. So Netscape was a company which actually developed the secure socket layer. And TLS, uh, which is uh, the newer version of uh, SSL, you can call it that way, it was developed by the IETF. So IETF stands for the Internet Engineering Task Force. So SSL was first released back in 1995. So it was released as version uh, 2.0 and it was released in, in back in 1995. So TLS um, um, almost uh, released after four years. Uh, it was released in the year 1999. So, th so SSL has around three versions, which includes the SSL 1.0, 2.0 and SSL 3.0. So after SSL 3.0, they didn't release any further versions of uh, SSL because it was agreed that uh, SSL has a, a lot of vulnerabilities. That's why they came up with TLS. And TLS has four versions which started from TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. And this is the most recent, which is TLS 1.3. And this is uh, the recommended version that you should be using for your websites. And all versions of SSL have been deprecated due to security flaws. Very important, all versions. But still, when we saw in SSL labs, still there are so many websites, thousands, which are still using SSL, which they shouldn't be using because they are already having vulnerabilities. They are already having vulnerability flaws, security flaws, so they shouldn't be using it. And in, in on the TLS side, TLS 1.0 and 1.1 have been deprecated since 2020 right and 1.2 and 1.3 are in use and uh, the recommendation is that even if you are on 1.2 you should be moving on to TLS 1.3 or any new websites that are coming up they should always straight away go to TLS 1.3 and just a quick comparison between uh, how the connection is made uh, in SSL the connection uses a port and in uh, TLS it uses a protocol so clear distinction so it uses a port to set up the explicit connection and uh, this uses a protocol to set up the implicit connection so right and yes in terms of uh, the um, the how it authenticates the messages or the kind of encryption it uses it uses it's based on mac which is message authentication code but in uh, tls they use hmac so h is the ex additional thing h stands for hash based mac uh, message authentication code so it's straight away related to what we did we did a deep dive on hashing what was hashing you just pass your message through a hashing alg algorithm to get a, a fixed length output right and then you can encrypt it using your uh, private key right so that is what uh, the tls is based on so tls uses hashing but um, the ssl doesn't use hashing and uses mac so just a very very quick um, i would say comparison between ssl and tls in the next video we will take a look at another newer protocol for security which is mtls thanks for watching okay so the time has come to look at mtls what does mtls stand for so mtls stands for mutual tls right so as a name suggests mutual it is both ways still now um, whenever we talked about tls we have talked about the client and the server and every time we said you have a client and you have a server 
But in this case, let's say when you are visiting a, a website like HSBC or you're visiting Amazon, the server used to send you the digital certificate, right? The server always used to send you the digital certificate. Client never used to send a digital certificate. And this digital certificate was always signed by the trusted authority, which was the certificate authority or a CA. And this is why we call it a one way TLS, right? But what happens in a MTLS as the name suggests mutual TLS here, the server tells the client, hey client, if you want to talk to me, you also need to provide me the certificate because I need to ensure that you are the right person I'm talking to. Because till now in one way TLS, it doesn't matter to the server, whatever the client is, because in, in, in one way TLS, we just want to ensure that we are actually talking to HSBC or we are talking to amazon.co.uk. But here, the server is questioning the client that, hey, if you want to talk to me, you need to provide the certificate as well. And that's why an MTLS is called a two way TLS. Right. So and if you see this example in, in, in this, uh, it will get really uh, easy for you. So here the client connects to the server. And as, as we studied in one way TLS, the server presents the TLS certificate. So the server sends its TLS certificate to the client. The client verifies the, the server certificate because how it verifies, I, I told you that the web browser will check based on the CA's public key, right? And in this case, then number four is the client presents the TLS certificate. Now it's client's turn. So server asks, hey, I've already given you the certificate. Now you need to give me your certificate back. I need to check as well, right? So the client presents the TLS certificate, the server verifies the client certificate and server grants the access. So once the server has granted the access, then this secure communication starts taking place between the client and server. And this is all encrypted communication. So let's take a look. So MTLS stands for mutual TLS or mutual authentication. MTLS enforces mutual authentication requiring both client and server to present a valid digital certificate, right? That is what we understood. And as I said, this is also called a two way TLS and we call it two way trust. So in MTLS client verifies the authenticity of the server certificate and server verifies the authenticity of the client certificates. It's as simple as that. Please don't get yourself confused. Client certificate. So the client, as we saw here, presents its digital certificate to the server during the TLS handshake process. This certificate contains the client's public key and signed by the trusted CA. Same like what we what the server used to do, like it, it, if, if you were Amazon.co.uk or Cloud Alchemy or um, say HSBC, you used to get your certificate, digital certificate signed by a trusted CA and you used to put your public key inside that certificate. Same way, the client has to put its public key and get it signed by the CA. Same way you will see what happens in server certificate. S exactly the same thing. The server presents its digital certificate to the client and the server certificate also contains the public key. So server's public key here and signed by a trusted CA. Same concept. And yes, so because it is two way TLS, we are adding an additional layer of security here, right? So MTLS adds extra layer of security by ensuring both parties are authenticated because previously the server didn't care whoever you are, the, the client, whoever is asking for services from the server. So we used to give that service. But now they are saying this mitigates the risk associated with unauthorized access or man in the middle attacks because here now both the client and server know each other and they know, yes, we are part of the same trusted CA and we know each other and we can securely connect and talk to each other. So um, normally they say, what is the use case? So uh, MTLS is normally used in scenarios which need stronger authentication. Normally um, I've seen a lot of cloud vendors, whenever you are using their services, their APIs, they would always be MTLS based or uh, mutual TLS based. So MTLS can be used for accessing sensitive APIs, um, uh, microservices, a lot of microservices uh, these days are using MTLS and also most of the web services that you will see uh, are actually based on MTLS. So uh, guys, I think you've got a very good understanding now. So whatever I told you, we have studied everything at length in the previous videos. 
If you really feel confused, always go back to those videos, um, read about those uh, digital certificates and um, have a look at those videos where we studied the, um, the TLS, we, where we studied what is digital certificate, what are trusted CAs. And this is all just a crux of everything. And what we learned here is MTLS, which is the mutual TLS. I hope you liked it. Thanks for watching. Hello and welcome. So one of the key protocols that we study is SSH. So SSH is a kind of protocol that you that comes into picture whenever you are uh, talking uh, to uh, a client and a server. So let's say you are uh, you are let's say sitting on a Mac system or a Windows system and you need to connect to a host probably it could be a Linux host that you have created uh, in, in the cloud. So it could be that you have created a cloud machine uh, in AWS, Azure, Oracle Cloud, and you want to connect to this uh, machine uh, if, uh, from your uh, client. So what protocol do we use? So we use an SSH protocol here. So what does SSH stand for? So the, the SSH stands for the secure shell. So uh, S stands for secure and SH stands for shell. Right. So it's, it's quite important protocol if you are actually connecting to your uh, Unix machines. OK, and uh, it's a we, we say it's a cryptographic network uh, networking protocol. Right. It enables secure communication and data exchange between two computers over an unsecured network. So as I said, uh, it enables secure communication. So this protocol will help you uh, to connect to another machine. So because th there is no other way, how, how would you connect and the important thing here is it needs to be secure communication. What mean what it means is that uh, the the data in transit is is also encrypted. So whatever um, uh, connection you are making should be a secure uh, connection and should be a secure communication. Just just think about it that you are a DBA or you are a system administrator and you need to manage your resources. So you need to connect to the client's computers from from your existing machine or, or normally we say a jump server, right? So you need to use the SSH or secure shell uh, to, to connect to it. And SSH is often used for remote access. So quite important, very important word is remote access. So your um, uh, let's say it's a physical server sitting somewhere in the data center. Now you need to access that. How would you access over the internet or how would you access over your network or, or your VPN? So you have to remotely access it. So there are two ways. Either you physically go and uh, visit your client site or physically uh, go to the data center or you can remotely access it. And it's not only access, but it's also the administration of the computers and servers where we use the SSH protocol. And very, very important thing that SSH encrypts the data during transmission. So we are talking about data in transit encryption and it prevents eavesdropping. So what was eavesdropping? I told you that in eavesdropping, you, the hacker can either intercept, delete or modify, modify the messages or the transmission. So SSH is a kind of a protocol which uh, helps to encrypt the data during transmission and it prevents eavesdropping. Um, users can securely log into the remote computer using SSH with e either username password or public private key pair. So it, it's more of uh, to understand that you let's say you have a Linux machine and that you created a test user, right? And this is your uh, own PC, right? This is your PC and you want to access using SSH. So what you need to do is uh, either you should know the uh, username password for uh, this user, right? For the test user, if you are doing an SSH from here to here, or there is a com uh, there is a concept of public private key pair. What we've already learned, like, so you would have a public key and you would have a secret key. So secret key stays here and the public key gets transferred in the authorized files of this computer. So because of this, you can easily do an SSH and you can give um, say something like um, say root at and give the um, say uh, the name of this machine. So something like Linux 12C, right? So th th this is how we access it. So it says there are two ways to securely uh, log in. Either you can uh, use a username password. Yes, if you know the uh, username and password like test and the password for this, or there is a mechanism of public private key pair where the public private key pair will be. Um, uh, so in, in this case, your um, private key stays uh, on the client side and on the on the server side, you'd be copying or you will have a copy of your public key so that this handshake can easily take place. 
So SSH uh, operates on the port 22 by default. So that if, you, if somebody asks you what is the default port for uh, uh, SSH, the, the SSH works on the port 22 by default. So SSH key pairs consist of private key, which is kept secret, and the public key, which is shared with server. So as I just explained here, so you will have a public private key pair. So the key, secret key or the private key stays um, uh, or is kept secret and it is used to log into the uh, servers and the public key is actually um, shared with the servers. The public key is used to authenticate the user while uh, private key remains on the user's device. So as, as we explained here, the private key stays here, right? But the public key is um, is actually uh, spread across or, or actually actually copied to uh, the uh, the server. And normally there's a file called authorized underscore keys where you would actually keep uh, your um, public key. And this is actually used to authenticate the user. Right. And um, quite important, um, if, if you are looking for uh, an open source version of um, SSH, then open SSH. You can always download it. You can it's easily available on the Internet. Open SSH is a widely used open source implementation of SSH. So, guys, um, just to quickly summarize, SSH stands for secure shell. It's basically a it's a secure shell that you're getting uh, on a computer. So if you see here, you are a client and you need to um, connect to a remote computer. We would say you are connecting to a remote computer uh, through this secure shell, right? So it's, it's quite important uh, that how uh, you use it. As I explained, either you can use it um, through a password mechanism or the, the recommended way is the public private key pair where private key stays on your uh, client computer and the public key is actually shared uh, with the server. And with this, it helps you to uh, have a good uh, proper handshake and the public key is used to authenticate the user while the private key remains on the user's device. So with this, we come to the end of the video. Thanks for watching. Okay, after taking a look into the previous SSH protocol, it's time to take a look into TCP IP. Now guys, when we actually studied uh, the networking lecture, in that we studied about the OSI model, right? So TCP IP model is a more practical model that addresses the communication challenges that relies on the standard protocols. But OSI itself is a comprehensive protocol independent framework. And if you see the number of layers as compared to the OSI model are much less. As you can see, there are normally we just keep around four layers. The, the, very, um, the bottom layer, we call it the network access layer, which controls the hardware component of the network. Like in, in OSI, you might remember there was a physical layer, there was a data link layer. In, there's, in, in this case, it's more abstracted, right? So we have much less layers, as you can see. Then comes the internet layer, which determines the path in the network. Like if you talk about the routers, what, what, uh, what path does your network packet take? Then uh, we talk about the transport layer, which supports the communication between diverse devices and networks and definitely the application layer which we also call the presentation layer. So what is TCP IP? So TCP IP is nothing but it's a set of networking protocols. Protocol is nothing but set of rules and it governs the communication and the data exchange between within the computer networks. So I always say that it is actually the backbone of today's networking, this TCP IP, right? And as you can see, the, it's actually uh, formed of two words, TCP and IP. And we'll take a look into each of these, right? So as I said, it's formed of two core protocols, TCP and IP. Now, what does TCP stand for? So the TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. So T is Transmission. C control and P protocol. What it does is it provides reliable connection oriented data transmission, which ensures data integrity and error handling. So, so the whole concept is that if you, uh, there shouldn't be any kind of tempering of data happening or the data that you requested, if it is not coming in the right form, then it shouldn't be uh, made available to you. Like, like we saw the example of um, as a client server, you are accessing a website, you're, you're watching a video on Netflix. So as I told you that the packets, they all first get accumulated. Once they are accumulated, then they are actually presented to you, right? So it's very important that error connect, error checking and um, packet switching uh, takes place at all, all, all this um, entire journey of the packets, right? 
Same way we have the IP. Now IP stands for internet protocol, which manages the addressing and routing of data packets between devices on a network. Now this, this is actually based on the IP addresses. Now, uh, as I told you, every, every computer or every host on the network has a unique address, which is called an IP address. So this protocol helps you to manage the addressing and routing of data packets. So as, as we saw that a packet can take different routes, as, as, as we uh, saw in the example where uh, the people were trying to reach to a specific place in, in US. Some uh, took the subway, some took the tram, some took the bus, right? But they all had to reach at one uh, possible destination or, or one uh, distinct destination. Same way the packets have know that they have to reach at a specific place, but they can take different routes. And this internet protocol, um, uh, protocol it's, it's actually managing your addressing and routing. So two important concepts come here, packet switching, which I already talked about. It's nothing but where TCP IP breaks the data into smaller packets for efficient transmission. Same way, which we showed you earlier, you had a Netflix video, you can't simply just play a Netflix video. So when the server sends it, the server will actually send it in millions of packets. And it and all these packets will start traveling from US, let's say coming all the way to, to UK, right? They will take, take different routes. They will go through hop by hop, hop by hop. They will choose different routers. And as, as it says, these packets travel independently across the network and are reassembled at the destination, right? So this is TCP IP. Then uh, the next concept, all part of TCP IP, which we studied uh, more of IP is it's uh, addressing, right? As I said, the devices on TCP IP network are assigned IP addresses, we, which we told you that every host on the network will have a unique IP address. So this is where addressing comes into picture. And we did discuss that there are two types of uh, addressing mechanisms, IPv4 and IPv6. So now you would have noticed that a lot of cloud vendors are actually increasing the price of the IPv4 public IP addresses because the number of public IP addresses that are available is reducing. So that's why they really want the companies or people to start migrating to the newer form of a uh, newer version of IP addressing, which is IPv6, right? So with this, we come to the end of the um, lecture on TCP IP. I believe you've got good understanding of what is TCP IP. We break the TCP IP into two protocols, TCP protocol, which is more of for providing a connection oriented data transmission, which ensures data integrity, error handling, and the IP part is more for the addressing and routing of data packets. So thanks for watching. Hi folks, welcome back. After taking a look into what is SSH and what is TCP IP, it's time to take a look into another important type of protocol, which is SSL. And guys, I always say SSL is the backbone for secure communication over the internet. So if, F if SSL or HTTPS was not there, you and me wouldn't have actually gone to amazon.co.uk, hsbc.co.uk, or any uh, shopping website and use your credit card details. Why? Because now we know that we are on a secure channel, right? Because it's it's all encrypted. When we are talking to a server, like say when, when you're talking to amazon.co.uk or when you're talking to mintra.com, you know that the traffic is, is encrypted and it's all thanks to SSL, right? Let's take a look what is SSL. So SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, SSL, Secure Socket Layer. It's a cryptography protocol that provides secure communication over internet. And the good thing is whatever I'll go through it, it will be so easy for you guys now because we have studied everything what we will talk about in depth. So I, now I just don't need to go into too much depth. I'll just mention it and you can go back to your previous lessons and you those things would be fresh in your mind because we've done really deep dive on those. So it's, it's commonly used to establish a secure communication between users, web browser and website server. So as, as we said, you are um, sitting on a client here and let's say you are accessing HSBC or Mintra.com, right? So uh, you are basically reaching a server here, right? So you are reaching a server or a web server, 
right? So it is establishing a secure connection between users web browser and the web server. So all this communication that is taking place back and forth is secure. Uh, how it is secure? We say it, there, there is a concept of encryption. So SSL will encrypt the data exchange between the user's browser and server, which ensures sensitive information remains confidential. So this entire traffic is encrypted. So if, if a man in the middle comes or if a hacker comes here, right? So the hacker won't see anything because it's all encrypted. We are also maintaining data integrity. As I said, that data integrity means that if you are sending the data, the data is in the same form, orig original form. So nobody is actually, or a man in the middle is not changing or amending the data, right? So this is uh, what we get with SSL. Thanks to SSL again, that you are getting data integrity of the transmitted data because the data is not being tra um, ta altered or tra uh, tampered. Uh, we get authentication. So how do we get authentication? Because SSL helps you to verify the identity of a website server and assuring that the users that they are communicating with the intended website. So what it means is that when you are accessing hsbc.co.uk, you have that peace of mind that yes, you are actually accessing hsbc.co.uk and not actually talking to a hacker somewhere sitting in the dark web. This is all again thanks to the authentication provided by SSL, right? And we have studied all these concepts at depth, uh, in depth, uh, when we looked at previous lessons, encryption, data integrity, authentication, non-repudiation, we all looked at all this. Oh yes, digital certificates. Again, so we again studied digital certificates a lot. So again, SSL comprises of digital certificates. So SSL relies on the digital certificates issued by the trusted authority, which is the trusted authority. Do you remember? Yes, we call it a CA or the certificate authority. Uh, so any example you remember? Yes, DigiCert, yes. So these certificates contain server's public key. As, as we told you that uh, whenever a server um, has to, let's say HSBC has to get a certificate, they'll go to the CA and um, give their public key. Uh, on top of it, they will give all their identity information as well because this uh, CA or the RA will be checking its um, uh, all the identity related information as well. And uh, SSL and HTTPS are the two terms that are uh, that can be used uh, in conjunction. So SSL is commonly used in conjunction with HTTPS. So if either you say HTTPS or you say SSL, it's one and the same thing. Uh, so HTTPS stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure because there is um, HTTP which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So what that protocol says is it's how you can actually communicate over the internet between the web browser and the web server. But when we add an S, we are talking about SSL or HTTPS, which is a secure version of standard HTTP protocol. And very important, the URL scheme, right? The websites that use uh, SSL or TLS will always have HTTPS, very important. Um, so if you are not having HTTPS or if you're just going uh, HTTP, although in today's world, you shouldn't be having HTTP websites because it means if you're having an HTTP website, what it means is that any hacker can stiff the data. They can uh, see the data because the data would be traveling in plain text. You wouldn't want that. That's why it's very important that your uh, website should be using HTTPS, which ensures that it is a secure connection. And another thing we saw in previous videos was a padlock icon. Always see, always remember that this is the kind of icon uh, that you will see. Maybe it was not a good drawing. So yeah, something like this, a padlock icon, a lock kind of icon comes uh, on the on the website, which actually shows on the address bar, which shows that it is a it is a secure communication, right? And very, very important thing. And we will see in, in the next video as well, what is TLS and uh, difference between SSL and TLS, but just try to understand that uh, TLS is actually a newer version of SSL because there were so many vulnerabilities that uh, the uh, the scientists uh, discovered or the cyber security professionals discovered in SSL that they discontinued using SSL and started calling it TLS. But as such, it is an evolution of SSL, which we call TLS, which is a transport layer security. So SSL has gone through several versions, including SSL 2.0, 3.0, and TLS, right? So now in TLS, the newest version is TLS 1.3. 
So previously it was TLS 1.2, now it's TLS 1.3. And TLS has largely replaced SSL due to security vulnerabilities in the older SSL version. So as I explained it to you, TLS is nothing but newer version of SSL because SSL had lots of um, uh, say vulnerabilities uh, figured out in that. So that's why the cybersecurity professionals started using TLS, which is transport layer security. And in TLS, the latest version is 1.3. In the next video, I'll actually show you, um, um, there's a SSL Labs a website in which we can show the usage of SSL, how, how many um, websites all over the world are using SSL, how many are using TLS, within TLS 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. We'll, we'll do a quick demo. So thanks for watching. Welcome to a very interesting demo on the usage of SSL versus TLS. So all you need to do is just go to ssllabs.com and there is a website which actually says that SSL Pulse is a continuous and global dashboard for monitoring the quality of SSL versus TLS support over the time. And they are talking about 150,000 SSL and TLS enabled websites, which is based on Alexa's list of most popular websites. So there is a, a list of most popular websites and this is what SSL Pulse does. It does a scan of all those sites and based on that, it collects the data and gives you on a dashboard. And this is very interesting uh, things uh, that it will tell you. If you see, it says that a number of total sites that it surveyed was around 135,000. And there were still a lot of websites, if you see around 51,599 sites were there which were having inadequate security, which means either they were not using the right protocol or the key uh, length uh, that they were using for their encryption was too small. So there could be several reasons for that. And based on that, it actually gives uh, the, uh, every site some kind of uh, ranking that whether you are in the A plus category, you are in A or A minus category. So if you see around 60, one uh, percent of the sites were actually in A category and uh, around 35.8 percent of them were in B category but still guys still today it's we are talking about something 2023 and st still there are so many websites which are actually in C, D and even F category right these could be the websites which are not even using secure socket layers um, th they are actually using something like an H HTTP mechanism uh, then it actually also tells you uh, the certificate chains. It shows, okay, 98% of the sites have complete certificate chains. So you, you might remember we studied the certificate chains where there is a top down up, um, from, from the top CA, you have the intermediate CA, and then you have the actual um, web server, right? So, and, and but there are something, uh, something like 2,498 um, websites, which are still having incomplete certificate chains, which is a big vulnerability in the security of the website right same way it shows the protocol support so if you see here if you see look at the graphs it actually indicates that people are still using ssl 2.0 3.0 which has been deprecated a while back but most of the websites if you see 99.9 .9 of the sites that were surveyed were using tls 1.2 and ideally, if you ask me today, they should be on TLS 1.3 protocol because it's the newest and more secure protocol as compared to TLS 1.2. So there should be a transition from TLS 1.2 to TLS 1.3. The other interesting thing that they show is uh, the good thing, actually, I would say a lot of uh, websites are actually using the 2048 key length for uh, the the um, the um, encryption, right? Th that is what we studied when we were uh, learning about encryption. But there are certain sites which are using 3072, which is a bigger key length, which is always good. And if you see here, uh, it also says which is the best protocol support. So if you see the transition is more towards TLS 1.3. So the aim uh, of um, the, the the cybersecurity professionals is that this graph should go and be on the lower side and TLS 1.3 should be on a higher side. So more websites should start utilizing TLS 1.3. Right. And rest are more uh, related to extended validation certificates, what kind of attacks um, uh, uh, these websites are prone to. So you can al always go through it. And yeah, another interesting one is what kind of certificate signature algorithms most sites are using. The good thing is that 95.8% are using the SHA-256 hashing algorithm. And some are actually even using a higher algorithm, which is SHA-512. But most of uh, them are using the SHA-256. 
so yeah guys um, you can always have a look play around with it and uh, the good thing about this is you can even go back in time so if you really want to go back um, say several years back keep clicking keep clicking and you you can even go several years i, I believe it, it takes data for several years let's say uh, if we are um, using a time machine and we're back in say year 2016 how did it look like so you see there is a transition that has happened right and now i'm talking about 2016 data and at that time there were there were a lot of uh, websites which were in f so and if you look at the protocol support at that time tls 1.3 was not even there so which actually shows you that uh, 2023 uh, tls uh, is 1.3 is a newer protocol right and and at that time the best protocol support was tls 1.2 right and at that time uh, the uh, key length was still 2048 so lots of changes have happened so people are moving in the right direction if you see these graphs uh, were were um, these graphs have really gone down so there are more sites that have come up in the a category and less sites are in f and d category right so yeah you can always play around with this data look around this website and it would be good learning for you to good get a good uh, uh, understanding of ssl tls some comparisons in the next uh, lesson we'll actually do some uh, further theoretical comparisons between ssl and tls thanks for watching Oh, this, this would be a short and crisp comparison between SSL and TLS. So we already talked about SSL and TLS a bit, but this one will give you a quick comparison uh, between SSL and TLS. So SSL or the secure socket layer was developed by Netscape, right? You might remember um, there was a Netscape navigator web browser it's it's been ages back uh, netscape was very po popular so netscape was a company which actually developed the secure socket layer and tls uh, which is uh, the newer version of uh, ssl you can call it that way it was developed by the ietf so ietf stands for the internet engineering task force so ssl was first released back in 1995 so it was released as version uh, 2.0 and it was released in in back in 1995 so tls um, um, almost uh, released after four years uh, it was released in the year 1999 so, th so ssl has around three versions which includes the ssl 1.0 2.0 and ssl 3.0 so after SSL 3.0, they didn't release any further versions of uh, SSL because it was agreed that uh, SSL has a, a lot of vulnerabilities. That's why they came up with TLS. And TLS has four versions, which started from TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. And this is the most recent, which is TLS 1.3. And this is uh, the recommended version that you should be using for your websites. And all versions of SSL have been deprecated due to security flaws. Very important. All versions. But still, when we saw in SSL labs, still there are so many websites, thousands, which are still using SSL, which they shouldn't be using because they are already having vulnerabilities. They are already having vulnerability flaws, security flaws. So they shouldn't be using it. And in, in on the TLS side, TLS 1.0 and 1.1 have been deprecated since 2020 right and 1.2 and 1.3 are in use and uh, the recommendation is that even if you are on 1.2 you should be moving on to tls 1.3 or any new websites that are coming up they should always straight away go to tls 1.3 and just a quick comparison between uh, how the connection is made uh, in ssl the connection uses a port and in uh, tls it uses a protocol so clear distinction so it uses a port to set up the explicit connection and uh, this uses a protocol to set up the implicit connection so right and yes in terms of uh, the um, the how it authenticates the messages or the kind of encryption it uses it uses it's based on mac which is message authentication code but in uh, tls they use hmac so h is the ex additional thing h stands for hash based mac uh, message authentication code so it's straight away related to what we did we did a deep dive on hashing what was hashing you just pass your message through a hashing alg algorithm to get a, a fixed length output right and then you can encrypt it using your uh, private key right so that is what uh, the tls is based on so tls uses hashing but um, the ssl doesn't use hashing and uses mac so just a very very quick um, i would say comparison between ssl and tls in the next video we will take a look at another newer protocol for security which is mtls thanks for watching okay so the time has come to look at mtls
what does MTLS stand for? So MTLS stands for mutual TLS, right? So as the name suggests, mutual, it is both ways. So till now, um, whenever we talked about TLS, we have talked about the client and the server. And every time we said you have a client and you have a server, but in this case, let's say when you are visiting a, a website like HSBC or you are visiting Amazon, the server used to send you the digital certificate, right? The server always used to send you the digital certificate. Client never used to send a digital certificate. And this digital certificate was always signed by the trusted authority, which was the certificate authority or a CA. And this is why we call it a one way TLS, right? But what happens in a MTLS, as the name suggests, mutual TLS, here, the server tells the client, hey client, if you want to talk to me, you also need to provide me the certificate because I need to ensure that you are the right person I'm talking to. Because till now in one way TLS, it doesn't matter to the server, whatever the client is, because in, in, in one way TLS, we just want to ensure that we are actually talking to HSBC or we are talking to amazon.co.uk. But here, the server is questioning the client that, hey, if you want to talk to me, you need to provide the certificate as well. And that's why an MTLS is called a two-way TLS, right? So, and if you see this example in, in, in this, uh, it will get really uh, easy for you. So here, the client connects to the server and as, as we studied in one-way TLS, the server presents the TLS certificate. So the server sends its TLS certificate to the client. The client verifies the, the server certificate because how it verifies, I, I told you that the web browser will check based on the CA's public key, right? And in this case, then number four is the client presents the TLS certificate. Now it's client's turn. So server asks, hey, I've already given you the certificate. Now you need to give me your certificate back. I need to check as well, right? So the client presents the TLS certificate, the server verifies the client certificate and server grants the access. So once the server has granted the access, then this secure communication starts taking place between the client and server. And this is all encrypted communication. So let's take a look. So MTLS stands for mutual TLS or mutual authentication. MTLS enforces mutual authentication requiring both client and server to present a valid digital certificate, right? That is what we understood. And as I said, this is also called a two-way TLS and we call it two-way trust. So in MTLS, client verifies the authenticity of the server certificate and server verifies the authenticity of the client certificates. It's as simple as that. Please don't get yourself confused. Client certificate. So the client, as we saw here, presents its digital certificate to the server during the TLS handshake process. This certificate contains the client's public key and signed by the trusted CA. Same like what we what the server used to do. Like it, it, if, if you were amazon.co.uk or Cloud Alchemy or um, say HSBC, you used to get your certificate, digital certificate signed by a trusted CA and you used to put your public key inside that certificate. Same way, the client has to put its public key and get it signed by the CA. Same way you will see what happens in server certificate. S exactly the same thing. The server presents its digital certificate to the client and the server certificate also contains the public key. So server's public key here and signed by a trusted CA. Same concept. And yes, so because it is two-way TLS, we are adding an additional layer of security here, right? So MTLS adds extra layer of security by ensuring both parties are authenticated because previously the server didn't care whoever you are, the, the client, whoever is asking for services from the server, server used to give that service. But now they are saying this mitigates the risk associated with unauthorized access or man in the middle attacks because here now both the client and server know each other and they know yes we are part of the same trusted ca and we know each other and we can securely connect and talk to each other so um, normally they say what is the use case so uh, mtls is normally used in scenarios which need stronger authentication normally um, i've seen a lot of cloud vendors whenever you are using their services their apis they would always be mtls based or uh, mutual tls based so MTLS can be used for accessing sensitive APIs. 
um, uh, microservices, a lot of microservices uh, these days are using MTLS and also most of the web services that you will see uh, are actually based on MTLS. So uh, guys, I think you've got a very good understanding now. So whatever I told you, we have studied everything at length in the previous videos. If you really feel confused, always go back to those videos, um, read about those uh, digital certificates and um, have a look at those videos where we studied the, um, the TLS, we, where we studied what is digital certificate, what are trusted CAs. And this is all just a crux of everything. And what we learned here is MTLS, which is the mutual TLS. I hope you liked it. Thanks for watching.